Microphones are on. I'm going to call the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for June 14th, 2022 to order. Welcome everybody to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The board that will be sitting on tonight's cases is member Steve Lianus, member James Sweeney, Fire Chief Brian Nardelli, our alternate member Monique Screenberry, myself, Chair Kenneth Galligan. We also have an alternate member who will be sitting in on two cases, Ms. Jame, Jamie Hodges. Our zoning enforcement officer, building and superintendent, clerk of the zoning board, Mr. James Plouffe, and our recording secretary tonight is Monica Fregazzo. Before we start the meeting, I would ask anybody that has a cell phone or electronic device, if you could please shut them off. If you need to use your phone, please go out into the hallway as it becomes very disrupt disruptive in this room. The format of tonight's meeting will be that I will read the case that's before us. Anyone that has an interest in the case or the spokesperson for the case will come up to the podium, make the presentation to the board. On completion of the presentation, I will ask the board members if they have any questions about what the presenter just presented to the board. If there are none, or when we finish that, I will then ask for anybody here that is in, wants to speak in favor of the petition. When that has been concluded, I will ask if there is anyone here that wants to speak in opposition to the proposal. When that is completed, I will ask if there are any public officials, elected officials, that want to be heard on the issue. Following that, I will close the public portion of the hearing, and I will open it up to discussion among the board members. At that point, the board will deliberate, and among the board, deliberate about what their decision may be relative to the case that was just heard. At some point, a board member will make a motion to grant. If another board seconds that, I will then call for a vote. In order for a petition to pass with a five-member board, we need a minimum of four affirmative votes to pass. So if the vote is five to nothing in favor, obviously it passes. If the vote is four in the affirmative, one in the negative, it will pass. If the vote is three to two, the petition will be denied. Following the roll call vote, I will announce what the decision is of the board, whether the petition has been granted or the petition has been denied. Prior to the start of the hearing, anyone who is listed on the agenda for tonight has the ability to withdraw from the hearing. So prior to the start of the hearing, a withdrawal is allowed. We have one withdrawal so far tonight, and I will read that case. And this case will not be heard tonight. It may be scheduled for a future date. But the case, if you are here for case number 2252, the position petition of Meghna Trust CEO Muhammad Islam, 23 Hotstone Road, Southeastern Mass, for a variance from Article 4, Section 2727, Article 4, Article 9, I should say, Section 2729, and Article 9, 2753, to allow a five-unit apartment building that has been shut down since 2017 by the Board of Health, along with parking relief, as existing property provides eight spaces in a C2 zone located 238 Warren Avenue, the front building. That case will not be heard this evening. So prior to the start of the hearing, is there anyone here that wants to withdraw before the hearing begins? Seeing none. I will begin the hearing. The first case before us tonight is case number 2242. The petition of Nathan Borges, 23 Holly Tree Lane, Middleborough, Mass, seeking a variance for a proposed single-story rear addition with a deck in a one R1C zone located at 70 Sprague Street. Attorney Burke.
Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, with your permission, my name is Jim Burke. I'm an attorney at law with offices at 48 North Pearl Street, Brockton, Massachusetts, and I have the pleasure of representing Mr. and Mrs. Davis, who own the property, along with uh, Nathan uh, uh, Borges, who is, in fact, their contractor. I'm coming into this a little bit late, so I did not file the petition, and what you essentially have is before you is a petition for variance, uh, and it references the uh, side lot restriction issue of a lot that fronts on two sides on two streets. Uh, I don't believe that a variance is the right form of relief to be asking for because this structure was built in 1960 and it was built prior to the enactment of the zoning bylaw. So in fact, what it would be would be a, a non-conforming use and an expansion of a non-conforming use. Uh, I, I think that's relevant. First off, the issue is the issue, whether it's a non-conforming use or whether it's a variance before you, and that is whether or not the side lot is acceptable or appropriate under the circumstances. Uh, if it is, in fact, a, uh, an expansion of a pre-existing use, then the issue would be whether or not the board makes a determination that the uh, addition would be substantially more detrimental to the existing neighborhood. We think the answer is that it would not. Uh, if I may point out the uniqueness of this particular property, even if we are seeking a variance, is that the size and the shape of the property. Uh, it is uh, very narrow in the rear. Uh, it has reduced frontage. And as you can see from the plan that you have before you, if you are able to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, comply with the revised ordinance as it relates to the uh, frontage and, and side lot restriction on corner lots, uh, it would be 15 feet. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure that applies, but nonetheless, that, that's, that's essentially what the standard is under the new uh, zoning bylaw. What you have here is a request by the homeowner uh, at roughly 11 feet. And if you take a look at the framework uh, within uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, plan that uh, Holmgren uh, presented, it's virtually impossible to expand the property in, in any way. In fact, all of, or most all of the existing structure is non-compliant uh, that doesn't meet the standard because of the uniqueness of the size and shape. So what we have here today is a determination of whether or not it is uh, more detrimental to the neighborhood. If you take a look at the structure that's directly below, I, I think the side lot there is roughly about eight feet. Uh, and it is an older neighborhood. It's an established neighborhood. And what they're seeking is not, in fact, out of custom or character uh, with the neighborhood. One of the thoughts that you could raise is whether or not there's the possibility of moving the addition in some way to make it less impactful. There is not. You're either going to allow them to expand their home or, or you're not, because wherever they put the property now is going to be exactly the same problem that we have before you. So uh, I, I think that's basically it. I don't know if the engineer has anything to add. But in, in fact, the, the issue before the board is whether or not, given the fact that the Davises would like to expand their property, uh, which is their permanent home that they want to stay, uh, and have a, an addition uh, that because of the way the internal lots are created makes sense. And, and I, that's it, if you've got any questions. Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, do you guys have a rendering of the proposed addition? I didn't get that in the packet. I don't know if anyone else sees it on the board. Okay. Would be useful just to see what we're proposing here. Can you explain to the board what it's going to look like? Yeah, 
uh, essentially all it's going to be is a bedroom. Um, and then there is currently a bathroom in that corner there. So they were hoping to kind of make up Jack and Jill. So that way all the plumbing and everything is in that area. That was why we chose that location to do it. Um, but I, I can show you if you'd like to see. I wouldn't mind. Would that be okay? Mind if I pass this down? So this is a single-story house as it exists. Correct. Can you tell us about the roof line of the new addition as opposed to the current house? going to have a full foundation or a crawl space? Uh, it'll be a crawl space. Okay, I believe what we're going to be looking at and voting on here tonight is a variance. Uh, the house is non-conforming based upon the zoning that was in place when it was built, obviously, but now the new addition is going to encroach on the new sideline setback. Correct. The sideline setback is 30 feet on the front, and it's also 30 feet on the side because it's set on corner of two streets. So the sideline setback relief is on 30 feet from that side yard setback. We all agree on that. Yep. And the hardship is the size, shape of the lot, and the, the, the location of the rooms in the house do not allow this to be put anywhere else uh, on the house. It has to go right where it is. That's accurate, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Board, any other questions? We're good? Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? <laughs> Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official or appointed official that wants to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public portion of the hearing. I'll open it up now for discussion among the board members. Board members. I don't see this as detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, it's a unique, a unique lot. Um, so I don't really see a problem with it. I, I would agree with that, too. I, I, I think it's uh, beneficial. Just trying to increase increase their property value. I'm sure it is a weird, strange, strange lot. By driving by it, it's. I don't. Th I think it adds more than it would ever take away. So I see this as an addition to the current living space in the house. There is no intention to put an in-law or anything else within this. I, I didn't. That's not going to be allowed. So. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve. Second. Motion has been made to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Delanis? Yes. Ms. Barry, uh, Ms. Greenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Chief Nardelli? Yes. Chair Galligan? Yes. Mr. Chair, that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Next petition is 22-43, the petition of Thatcher Street Realty, LLC, for Trinity Lane, Lakeville, Mass., for a variance from Section 2725, 2757, subsection 3, to construct an unpaved parking lot to provide employee and customer parking in conjunction with its existing business in an R1C zone located at 554 Thatcher Street. I'll point out to the board, as I'm sure the clerk is aware, we, we have essentially two requests for side-by-side -side lots. So essentially, the arguments are going to be somewhat identical. 
uh, but we'll deal with that uh, as, as, as called. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, my name is Jim Burke, an attorney at law with offices at 48 North Pearl Street in Brockton. And I have a, I have the distinct pleasure of representing the Andrades and the Andrade family. Uh, Roy uh, and Tom, his son, are here, and they own Everett's Auto Body, and it's been Everett's Auto Body since 1955. Uh, it's, it's a unique business. Uh, it, it's a salvage business. It's an auto parts business. Now it's a tire business. It's wholesale. It's retail. Uh, the business is conducted online and the Internet, uh, and it is uh, an ever-expanding use in what was a very unique and quiet section of the city of Brockton right at the uh, East Bridgewater line. In fact, uh, uh, when the uh, uh, Andrades opened their business, they were quickly joined by uh, uh, Dick Clayton, who unfortunately passed away this weekend, uh, and uh, Mr. Gallant, uh, so that you have three uh, automotive uh, junkyards for what it's worth, and they are all in exactly the same section of the city of Brockton. Uh, within uh, easy walking distance of the other. Uh, the City Council, uh, in, in its wisdom, was kind enough to grant an overlay uh, for the property on the west side of Thatcher Street uh, that is owned by uh, the Andrades and where the main business is conducted, uh, both the, uh, the business operation uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the wrecking and, and the parts, uh, as well as the salvage. Uh, that's also part of... Uh, uh, Mr. Gallant's uh, business, uh, all of which essentially allows them as an overlay district to conduct the business of a junkyard. The property across the street was owned by Mr. Clayton, was purchased uh, within the past year by the Andrades for purposes of security uh, because residential homes just don't do well next to junkyards. Uh, if, if there's anything that's absolutely clear, this residential zone uh, property, the two residential zone properties, uh, became uh, functionally non-existent uh, decades ago. Uh, the, the likelihood of any use that's allowed by a residential zone being placed on either of these properties is absolutely remote. Uh, the best utilization of the property is part of what the uh, Android seek, which is a, a parking lot expansion for their employees uh, and for excess customers uh, to allow them to uh, expand the area uh, and also occasionally put down uh, heavy equipment in the parking lot, which is a principal reason why they're not seeking to have a, a bituminous uh, put down on the property and seek the variance that's before the board. I think you've dealt with this before in Mr. Lynch's tow yard and, and, and some others. Essentially, what they would do is put reclaim, uh, uh, on, on the property, pack it down. Uh, they would, uh, of course, level it and create a, uh, a, a, a surface that uh, is level, presentable. And then if it gets to the point that they are going to develop it in another way, uh, then what they will uh, have to do is either come before this board uh, or they'll have to go to the planning board for site plan approval. Uh, I, I point out that uh, the Andrades have been a good members of this community. They, they employ roughly about 100 people. Uh, their annual payroll is roughly about $4.5 million. Uh, and they, uh, uh, in fact, uh, have a great impact uh, on the local community. Uh, the hardship, if you look at it, I think is, uh, is twofold. One, I touched on the fact that it is functionally impossible to utilize the uses allowed in the primary district uh, for residential housing uh, or for any other use uh, that's authorized within that setting, which I touched upon in the brief. Secondly, if you look at the lots, the shape of the lots especially affected. One lot has 26 feet of frontage. Uh, the other one has, I believe, 124 or 125 feet of frontage. What that tells you is that when the substandard and dilapidated structures come down, which they must, then you would need to come back before this board, even if it was for a residential use. You could not reclaim the utilization of this property without seeking relief by way of a variance. So I think it meets the statutory uh, function of a hardship, whether they're relating to the size, shape, topography, soil conditions, 
uniquely affecting the properties in a whole and not the zoning di district, it creates a hardship financial or otherwise. So we'd ask the board to consider granting the relief uh, to allow them to uh, expand the facility just as the parking lot at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Burke, you said um, there'll be heavy equipment potentially in that lot as well? Uh, I, I, I'm not stressing that, but I think that's the possibility that they may be trucks uh, with some weight uh, and uh, tow trucks, for example. Uh, I, 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 not wrecker equipment, uh, but uh, probably the likelihood of tow trucks in the area, which, as you know, with the weight distribution, uh, would impact significantly if it was, in fact, an asphalt surface. Yeah, I guess my concern is the, the, where the yard is across the street, equipment going back and forth, and the danger and public safety concern of them crossing Thatcher Street. And that's not the case. It will, it will just be what, what you said, tow trucks or trailers bringing stuff in there, potentially, but not, nothing going back They will not forth. be working the system as part of this lot. Uh, all they will be using it for, and all the relief that's before you is as a parking lot. Will this just be a dirt lot? Uh, no, I, I, what they'll do is, uh, I, I call it reclaim. Uh, you, you know, the grinding of the roads and the material that results from the grinding of the roads, uh, they actually uh, purchase that, and it's not cheap. And lay it down, uh, roll it, flatten it, cover it, create a surface. So uh, it will be a, 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 an asphalt surface. It just will not be uh, a, a finished asphalt surface. And it so will be... Uh, permittable, so it will allow, in fact, uh, water runoff within the uh, uh, the property. Okay, so there wouldn't be much issues with dust? There would be no issue with dust. Uh, in fact, uh, we certainly can put it as a condition of the variance that they, 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 they meticulously keep their property. It's a hard business, uh, but they meticulously keep their property. Thank you. Will there be any unregistered vehicles that will be stored on this property? No, there won't. Uh, again, uh, the, the, the plan is for customer parking uh, and employee parking, uh, and as we said with the tow trucks, uh, employee equipment uh, or, or business equipment, but no unregistered vehicles. Can you describe what the proposed parking lot will look like as... The regulations usually talk about a berm, a curb, lighting, things of that nature. Is this just going to be a cleared off piece of property that reclaimed blacktop will be placed over the dirt and that's the end of the parking lot? I think that's the intent today uh, of what it's going to be. Uh, when, when they get to the point uh, of doing a substantial development, it'll probably involve a structure. And at that point in time, they will need to come back before this board, certainly the planning board. And, and, and if I may add, I believe that the, uh, the parking lot development does not fall under the purview of the planning board. It does, however, fall under the planning board of the city engineer. So right. you, you need the review and consent of the city engineer to the design. So I, I imagine that's going to be incorporated uh, in the final product, Chief. Well, the reason I ask is there was no presentation about what physically this would look like. Uh, it looks like it's going to have one entrance onto Thatcher Street. Uh, I don't see any uh, vegetation or anything, just a stockade fence. Uh, and, you know, I, I've been over there. I looked at the area. I know pretty much what you're talking about. So there are two things that I need to bring up here. One is from the city engineer and a letter that was sent that says the DPW does not allow unpaved parking and has the sole responsibility for approving all parking lots with more than five parking spaces in the city. It is environmentally unsound to allow even five unpaved parking lots in any city not to talk to Brockton. Uh, this is not in the purview of either the planning board or the zoning board. Under zoning, under 2757, uh, this is the one that speaks to us. Uh, plans for such areas shall be approved by the city engineer and the highway department to ensure compliance with these regulations. Uh, I'm just a little disappointed here that we're not 
hearing anything from the city engineer on a positive nature or anything from the highway department on a positive nature? I think if you look at the existing relief that's been granted in the city in a couple of instances, uh, this will be essentially the same. And what, what may be, uh, and I don't think it's, uh, it, it's artful use of words, but there's going to be asphalt. It's just not going to be, uh, it'll be more like a primary coat uh, because it will be reclaimed uh, that will be uh, leveled and, and made part of the surface. So it won't be a dirt surface, which I think is where the engineer was coming from. Uh, it will be uh, 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 covered. Uh, it just will not meet the requirements of the section uh, referenced by the chief in terms of uh, asphalt paving. And, and for this use, in this very hard area, I think it's very, it's reasonable. I think it's reasonable. Mr. Burke, will it be, will it be bound or not bound? It'll be loose, but just rolled, correct? It'll be rolled. Rolled, not, not bound together as, no. okay. So, so it, won't be, it won't be an undercoat? It will for, not be a an primary undercoat, coat. No. Okay, I understand. I think what he's describing is the reprocessed blacktop they take when they skive a street and put a new, I think that's what we're referring to. Uh, so you're telling us there won't be any unregistered cars on the lot. Uh, the operation of the junk cars across the street and the selling of used cars across the street, this is not planned to be an expansion of that use? It is not. Absolutely is not. Okay. So the plan I have here has two sections to it, and one of these sections we'll be addressing in the next? Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, board members, any uh, Mr. Burke, uh, this, if I'm looking at this uh, correctly, this first plot here, there's obviously one way in, one way out, right? Um, approximately how much space is between the street and the first tip of the parking spots there from one to eight? I'm going to grab the engineer. Uh, the distance distance between the street and parking spots one through eight. Six feet. Six feet. Okay. Uh, which leads me to my question: Would you would the partitioner be against, or would your party be against any green in the front of the street? Yes. Yeah, he would be agreeable. Okay. There may be some now, but when you get to clearing a lot, who knows what stays. Okay, thank you. So are you suggesting that there should be more than six feet of setback between the street and the cars? Well, the green space? I wasn't suggesting that, I was suggesting if there is enough space that uh, a buffer of green bushes along the street line Okay, any other questions from board members? Uh, yes, I, I don't know if I missed it, but did you say there's going to be no lighting there? I'm sorry. I it, that. Is there going to be any lighting in the uh, parking I, lot? I don't believe they're planning uh, any, uh, any lighting, uh, nor will the uh, operation essentially be used at the nighttime. It, and once the store closes, uh, the, the, uh, the employees are gone and the customers are gone. I, I guess to offer Mr. Landis's concern then, what about wintertime operations when it's dark at 4 p.m. and their hours of operation go later than that. Are we concerned about safety aspect of it? I, I just get concerned about people coming out of there just like I do about equipment going back and forth across Thatcher Street, the public safety aspect of it. I think we, there needs to be some sort of a lighting plan think, here. Chief, not, not, not to interrupt, but I think that if the board were, were uh, 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 kind enough to grant the relief that's requested. Uh, these certainly could work out with the engineering in terms of what lighting would go and where and and uh, what type of lighting and where. Because uh, I don't see that as an unreasonable position. Uh, but I, I just not exactly sure we can deal with it now. But certainly the engineer has a say, and we'll work with him. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? All good? I'll close that portion. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Please come forward and give your name to the clerk. 
and please speak into the microphone. My name is Donald Goyente. I own uh, Brockton Auto Parts, Regal Auto Parts, uh, right up the street from them. I own, also own some property across the street. Zone the same zoning. I'm in favor for letting them get whatever they need to, you know, no residential over there. I don't have any neighbors. I don't believe they have any neighbors. Uh, I'm in favor for them, 100%. Okay, okay. someday I might be in the same boat. Okay, <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in favor? Hi, my name is uh, Ivory Hunter. Could you speak and, uh, a little louder, please? Hi, yes, my name is Ivory Hunter, and uh, I'm going to speak on behalf. I'm a customer. I go there a lot, and what I think they, uh, what they're going to do, really going to, you know, make it a better place for people to go, you know, to buy their auto parts. You know, I, you know, it's a very well taken care of place, and uh, I would recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official who wants to be heard on the issue? Okay. Councilor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey Thompson, Ward 5, City Councillor. Um, I'd like to uh, speak in favor of this project. Uh, the, uh, the city just recently uh, entered, uh, uh, declared uh, this property a surplus property, or at least a portion of this property a surplus property so that it could be uh, further developed. I, I know that um, Everett's Auto uh, will, will develop this into a parking lot at this point. Um, I support uh, the development of a parking lot, and then we'll see uh, what f future developments happen on this lot uh, further down the road. Uh, as for the hardship, I, I agree with uh, Attorney Burke that that this is uh, there's very uh, little call for uh, residential use in this area of Thatcher Street, um, and so and and uh, um, additionally, the frontage I do not believe would support any uh, new construction uh, in this area. Um, Chief, I heard your comments uh, regarding lighting, and, and I uh, totally agree that uh, there should be some lighting requirements uh, in this area. So I will work uh, both with the developer and uh, the chief engineer uh, to make sure that some form of lighting is put into place uh, for public safety. But uh, again, I believe this is a, um, a good use of this property at this point. Um, I'm happy that those dilapidated buildings uh, will come down. And so uh, I'm here to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other elected official want to be heard? If not, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public hearing portion of the hearing. I'll now open it up for discussion amongst board members. Board members. Mr. Chairman, uh, just as the fire chief, we've worked with the Everett's Auto Parts and the Andrade family for many years, and they've always run a top-notch operation. I just think that you know, what they're asking for here is going to, you know, if it's going to enhance their business and enhance the area, then what's going on right now, I think it's, I, I, I hate to put it in these terms, but it's great for a junkyard area to have what they need to be able to perform the operations they're going to do. No one's building a $800,000 house across from here, and if this is the use for this property, then we should look at that in a positive light. Everything they do over there is clean and neat, and I'm sure they'd work with the city and whomever else to make sure that we're, Make, make sure it's safe. I mean, that's, that's the reason I'm on this board to begin with, and, and, and the concerns I have about the lighting and equipment back and forth, I'm sure that, you know, they've heard the concern I have. I'm sure they would not have any issues with that at all. Yeah, I would, I would agree that um, it's a betterment than what's there now. Um, so, and, and everything the chief said. You know, I, I agree, and uh, I think that reclaimed asphalt would work. Um, yeah, and I think they should do something with the lighting, and uh, uh, I don't see anything residential going there. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like a good project. I think this almost comes down to a definition of what uh, blacktop is. 
Most parking lots we see is a finished blacktop. What he's proposing to do is reclaimed blacktop, which is a material that uh, would would not allow dust and everything. It, it won't be a dirt parking lot, obviously. But I think in our deliberations here, we need to consider uh, a, a finished blacktop parking lot in a C2 commercial area with maybe granite edge stones, Cape Cod berm, whatever we normally require. This is kind of a unique location where it's located. Uh, I'm, I, I have concern with the letter from the, the engineer that they need to have the ability to approve what goes into this lot. So I think what we're looking at here is to grant, it's going to be a use variance, by the way. It'll still remain as residential. We're not changing the, 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 uh, the uh, zoning in that area. So it, it's a use variance to allow that to be used for kind of a unique uh, set of circumstances. And I think if the city engineer takes a look at what's proposed to go in there with what I think is reconstituted blacktop, which is a material that's very similar to finished blacktop, which would accomplish the same, I think, end result. I think it's a good idea that to make that area a little bit more attractive over there, to have some green space between Thatcher Street and that parking lot. Now, on the plans, it shows only six feet of setback, and with, with all the parking they got there, I can't for the life of me understand why that couldn't be expanded to 10 feet of setback with some kind of deciduous trees planted in there. Uh, Lord knows that section of, of Thatcher Street needs some spiffing up over there. And uh, this is an opportunity to do that. What's there now is certainly not a good situation and it, it will never be developed as residential. So. To conclude my remarks, my suggestion is if this was to be approved, that a stipulation be put on this, that I think probably rather than six feet of setback, we should be looking at probably 10 feet of setback, which would probably lose maybe four parking places to make that fit in there. Uh, I think the lighting of the lot needs to be looked at probably with some other agency within the city. Uh, but I do think that the city engineer should have something to say relative to drainage of the lot. I see there's a retention area. Uh, I don't think it's the position of this board to determine uh, how fluids are going to run off this lot and get caught in a detention area. Uh, I think the petitioner probably knows that very, very well, that the problem with the city engineer relative to a dirt parking lot is that any oil or substances that come out of vehicles go directly into the surface of the ground, right into the groundwater. And that's the purpose of what the city engineer has said here, that it needs to be a impervious uh, type of uh, surface on that parking lot. So I'm leaning towards looking at this reconstituted blacktop as an impervious surface that would kind of meet what our definitions are here. A, I would also suggest that if somebody makes a motion to grant that the setback from the street be a minimum of 10 feet, uh, there should be some type of a berm along the parking lot that designates parking spaces one through eight and the entrance as it's drawn on this plan should be at least no less than a blacktop curbstone, not a Cape Cod berm, but a curbstone. And my concern there is if we don't do that over a period of time, the entire front of this parking lot will become wide open and people will just drive in and out anywhere they want without coming in and out of the designated area. So if that front is expanded to at least 10 feet and the stipulation is that that entrance is controlled by a vertical berm to control the location of where vehicles will be entering and exiting this location. Uh, 
I just wish we had heard a little bit more about that, but I'm just suggesting that if the board leans towards that, I think it's very important that that be included. Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I agree. I, just to add to your comments, though, we're not asphalt experts, and the fact that there's no one here from the city engineer's office or the DPW to talk about this, and we received a letter unpaved versus paved and what binding and what binding isn't, I, I would agree that we're not in a position to make that decision. I do also agree with the green space in that area that you noted as a stipulation and some lighting. So I, I, would, I would make a motion to grant with those stipulations. Second. All right, so the motion is made to grant with the stipulations that the front setback from the property line at Thasher Street to the, pro to the parking lot is no less than 10 feet, correct? Correct. And we should see some deciduous trees planted in there or some green shrubbery and also that the driveway, the entrance, is delineated by a vertical berm, Correct. not a Cape Cod berm. Correct. Okay, the motion is out there. Seconded. Properly seconded. Somebody second it? Okay, motion's been made and seconded to grant. All those in, uh, yeah. <laughs> Please call the roll. <laughs> Mr. Lanus. Yes. Ms. Monique, uh, Ms. Screenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Chief Nardelli? Yes. Chair Galligan? Yes. Mr. Chair, that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted with the stipulations as described. Mr. Chairman, we uh, thank the zoning board and, and, and now into the second argument, All which right. is the before second you start, line. Before you start, I need to read it. All right. <laughs> the next petition, 2244, the petition of Thatcher Street Realty LLC, 4 Trinity Lane, Lakeville, for a variance from section 2725, 2757, subsection 3, to construct an unpaved parking lot to provide employee and customer parking in conjunction with its existing business in an R1C zone located 558 Thatcher Street. Let me just take a little editorial uh, liberty here. And that is going to be a paved parking lot as we described with reconstituted blacktop. Okay, proceed. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have uh a, a similar use request along with the seeking of relief uh, from the, uh, the ordinance in relation to uh, uh, the, the asphalt uh, uh, pavement substance. Uh, I would suggest that if the uh, chairman and the board allows me, I'm happy to incorporate by reference my argument uh, in the last hearing uh, because the arguments and the requests for hardship are identical might help the expeditious moving of this meeting. <laughs> Board members, any questions? Everybody's good? So in this one here, if somebody makes a motion at some point here, I would expect that we are going to be looking at the same uh, stipulations that we put on the last time. Uh, with the encouragement that uh, on the last one, I suppose we should add this. Uh, we, the board should encourage that the petition to do something about lighting, even though it hasn't been stipulated, I think in a good faith manner, uh, basically the petitioner should be encouraged to do something with lighting for safety of people that may be crossing the street. And I see the petitioner shaking his head, so I think we're in agreement. Board member, and no, are we all set? Yeah, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected or appointed official who wants to be heard on the issue? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeff Thompson, Ward 5 City Councilor. Again, good evening, uh, Board. I, I'll just... Uh, uh, restate my support uh, for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Are there any other elected officials that want to be heard on the issue? If 
Don, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public hearing. I'll now open it up for discussion among board members. Board members. Ditto. <laughs> All right, so what I'm hearing is the same stipulations that we put on the last one yep. uh, with the encouragement for lighting. lighting. Motion to Motion. grant with the same uh, stipulations. Second. Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Motion's been made to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Lanis? Yes. Ms. Greenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Chief Nardelli? Yes. Chair Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Chair, it's five to, five to zero, and are they affirmative? The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Thank the board for its time. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Oh, okay. Make sure you don't leave. In the next case at hand, the fire chief is going to recuse himself from the hearing, and in his place, our alternate member, Jamie Hodges, will be sitting in his, his place and voting. The next petition is 2245, the petition of Melanie Gomes, 612 Pearl Street, Brockton, Mass, for a variance from section 279, 2713, and 2720 for a proposed additions on a pre-existing non-conforming lot in an R1B zone located at 612 Pearl Street. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Ed Jacobs, uh, PMP Associates, and I'm here uh, representing Ms. Melanie Gomes, uh, 612 Pearl Street, for a um, variance request. Uh, Ms. Gomes wants to build two separate additions off the rear of her house. Um, this lot is also a pre-existing non-conforming lot. It is very similar to the first um, hearing that was on the agenda tonight, where it's on the corner of two different streets, Pearl Street and Mayotte Circle. So therefore, and it's an R1B zone. So we have two 30-foot uh, front setbacks and um, a 30-foot rear setback. So there's not, and the lot is only um, 10,000, a little over 10,000 square feet, so there's not um, any room to put an addition on the house to the rear um, without encroaching. In fact, it already encroaches into the rear. So if you look at the plan I have on the easel, what's outlined in blue is the existing house, and up into the northeast corner of the property is an existing garage. The house was built in the 1800s. The garage was added in 1925. The lot was actually created in uh, 1974 or 1965, and it was added on to in 74 so that the garage would become part of it uh, when they put in uh, the subdivision on Mayotte Circle. So the addition, I have floor plans. I don't know if they were part of the package. No, I'm going to just, I, if I may, I got one set of 11 by 17s that will give you an idea of what... of the additions is just a second floor addition to expand a bedroom up there and make it into a uh, master bedroom. And the smaller addition at the northeast corner of the house is um, there's a study in that small little room now and when the addition um, that's basically going to be for a closet and to expand that into a larger bedroom. So as I said, the, the lot is pre-existing non-conforming. The house has been there long before zoning. And um, all the houses, all the lots in the neighborhood are about the same size because they were all built in the, in the same era. 
all through that neighborhood up there off of Pearl Street on both sides of Pearl Street. And I don't believe that adding these two additions to that house uh, will be detrimental to the neighborhood at all. And the reason that house, that uh, addition is only for the second floor, the larger addition is because there's a um, bulkhead cellar entrance below it. I'll take any questions. Are you constrained relative to the current house where this addition can be placed? Yes, there's the addition, if you look at the um, floor plans, the addition going to the north is only a one story. So if we were to expand it that way, it would have to be a two story addition. They'd have to blow out the roof and, and add up that way. So when you say north, you're talking where that small addition is going to go? Yes. So the roof line of this new addition, can you tell us what that's going to be in relation to the current roof line of the house? Yeah, it's it's on that plan. It's basically the house is facing, the peak of the house runs from Pearl Street back, and the, um, the addition to the back is going to be the same, and the uh, addition, the smaller addition to the northeast will be like a shed roof running up to the peak of the existing house, the one-story addition. So looking at this from Pearl Street, you would not really see an imposing structure that's no, been added to this? not at all. One little wing off the side, that's it. For And then it would disappear behind the peak. And that's only at the second floor level? Yes. As you realize, this is another one of those that requires setback on the side more than others because of the side yard street yes. level. Yeah. Correct. And the current foundation obviously uh, creates the hardship that you described as to where this can be placed. Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, to the building inspector, should we be looking at maybe granting relief on the location of that garage while we're doing all this? <sighs> that does not conform to today's requirements. However, we don't know how long that building has been there. Yeah, 1925. 1925. The existing non-conforming, but if you wanted to grant relief to clean it up. Honestly, I think at this point, if we're granting a relief for the house, this would be the opportunity to grant some relief for that garage so that doesn't become an issue. That's three and a half feet. Yeah. All right, board members, any questions? Board's good? Board's good, yeah. Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official that wants to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public hearing. I'll now open it up for deliberation among the board members. Board I think, members. I think this is in symmetry with, um, you know, the existing structure here. It's not an outrageous request. Um, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I don't see this as being detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, it seems pretty simple. I agree. All right, so the other thought that was brought out is that garage that was constructed in 1925 and has been sitting where it has been sitting since 1925 uh, does not conform to current zoning regulations. It would probably be wise to grant relief on that garage as it exists right now since it's, it is where it is. Make that a stipulation. So we'll add that to the grant if this is granted. Yeah. Motion to grant. Second. On, on the motion, I would just suggest that what we're granting here is the ability to add more living space, which I understand is probably going to be a bedroom. Yes. On the second bedroom. floor. And I think we all need to understand that whatever is going to happen with this dwelling, that this is not going to expand into more than a single family 
residential dwelling and no indication whatsoever of any in-law or anything of no. that nature. Strictly no. living Master space. Bedroom. Yes. Bedroom. Okay, as long as we understand that. All right, motion's been made and seconded to grant. Mm -hmm. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Delanis? Yes. Ms. Screenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Ms. Hodges? Yes. Chair Gallagher? Yes. Chair, there's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Thank you very much. The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Also, with that granting, we will include the location of the garage. Somebody want to tell the fire chief to come back in? The next petition, 2246, the petition of Leetta and Mara J. Carney and Robert J. Kelly, 15 Chilton Road, Brockton, Mass., for a variance from Section 27.9 to reconfigure the property line between two properties located in R1A zone, located number 7 and number 15 Chilton Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, my name is Ed Jacobs, PMP Associates, and uh, with me tonight is Mara Carney. Laura lives at 7 Chilton Road, and we're here for a petition to um, redivide the property lines between these two homes. Uh, Mara currently resides at number 7, and uh, her sister resides at number 15. These properties have been in the family for a And right, oh, as I said, right now the only way 15 Shelton Road can access it is to climb into it. Yeah, yeah the doorway to get in right there. On 7 Shelton Road property. so you can um, kind of get an idea of the uh, magnitude of it. Just give it to the clerk. Yeah. These two, right? Yeah, you yeah, can I pass them out. Sure. Let the clerk pass them out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the foundation is not um, your typical foundation that you think like is in the ground. It's out of the ground about five feet. In places, it's up to five feet wide. 
It's a beautiful old field stone foundation. Inside is all lawn. Um, it's almost like an old Victorian courtyard in there. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and as I, as I said, if you look at the pictures, you can understand the uh, historic nature of it. And I think uh, Marla can give you a little bit more history on it. The foundation is the original barn. To... Marla, please speak right up oh. to the mic. The foundation is the original barn to the home next door to us on Pleasant Street. And the walls on our side of the property are the ones that are five feet wide, and they're also about eight or nine feet high. On my brother-in-law's side, they're more narrow and lower, but his house is up much higher than ours. So he, it's more level with his property when you look at the pictures, but he would have to climb into it. So we've always maintained the property at Seven Chilton Road all these years. And we just wouldn't want anyone to purchase the, his house and destroy the wall, destroy the area. All right, so Mr. Jacobs, could you just reiterate to the board again what the hardship is on this piece of property? I think I heard the historical significance of the foundation. Correct. Yeah. yeah. What else, anything? No, that's about it. All right, so if this line is withdrawn, that then puts the side walkway on Chilton Road fully onto the new uh, layout. It'll be 10 feet, 7 inches fully yes. onto that piece of property. Uh, I will ask if there is any uh, uh, any idea here that we're going to sell off or further try to subdivide this property. I would say that that it, it probably is not going to be looked upon as something that no no yeah no. Nope. So this is strictly for aesthetic pur purposes and to preserve the history of that foundation, which was a huge ban years ago. Correct. Yes. And basically what we're looking at here is the redrawing of the two lot lines. The two lots currently exist. All right, uh, are you all set? Yes. Okay, board members, any questions from board members? Uh, just real quick, is there any plans for that foundation moving forward or just historic preservation? To stay empty and field. There's no, I know it's family, but there's no concerns about the lot lines. It's, is it own the deed for both properties? You're just going to change the lot line is all We're it just is. Just going to change the lot line. Okay, that's all. Yeah, thanks. I'm just happy to see. I've driven drive by it all the time when you took all the trees down. I was like, what? I couldn't figure out what it was. So it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, and I d went to do a landscaping plan. That's when I realized where the lot line was because there's never been a fence up <laughs> that in, in that I've ever known of, and that's when I was concerned and wanted to landscape all, put all the new landscaping in, and then I realized I don't own <laughs> most of my property. <laughs> board members, any other questions? Everybody's good. I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official that wants to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'll close that portion of the hearing. I do have one other question for the petitioner. Uh, I know that this is within the family, but we are presuming that the additional house to the left is fully in, in agreement with what we're doing here. Yes, yes they are. Yeah, you are the owners. Yes. All right, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing, which is the public hearing. I'll close that. I'll now open it up for discussion among the board members. Board members. Uh, we just said that the signature of the other owner is on the application? Yes. Okay. Everybody's good? Motion to grant. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Lanis. Yes. Ms. Screenberry. Yes. Mr. Sweeney. Yes. Chief Nardelli. Yes. Chair Galligan. Yes. The chair that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative.
The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Good luck. The next petition is 2247, the petition of Joanna Colleet and Courtney Barnett, 105 Pine Tree Lane, Rainham, Mass, for a special permit from section 2732, subsection 3C, to operate a tattoo parlor in a C5 zone located at 478 Torrey Street in Unit 1. This is an allowed use with a special permit. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Attorney Jake Creedon. With me is Joanna Coley and Courtney Barnett. Our request is to take over an existing uh, C5 use, but the city requires a tattoo parlor to be in a C5 zone, a commercial zone. The location is at Torrey and Belmont Street, uh, as I'm sure every member Torrey of the- Torrey and Pearl. Torrey and Pearl. Tony and Pearl, I'm sorry, Tony and Pearl. Uh, I'm sure as all of you know, there's perhaps 10 different suites in there that have been occupied for a long time. Most of them have been bought and condominiumized uh, by the owners. They are all professionals, uh, real estate, lawyers, doctors, dentists. We would be going into suite one, which you have before you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my apologies. Um, Scott Rogers was supposed to be here uh, with the plan. I know you have plans in front of you. Oh, here you are. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And as you uh, may recall, some of you, they were before this board uh, on Torrey Street, uh, down right ad adjacent to um, Thorny Lee Golf Course where they've been practicing the artistry of tattoo uh, business for almost seven years now. Uh, they've had an opportunity with a lease and an option to purchase suite number one, which is in um, the floor plan. As the, for directions, it's the most easterly point of that building, suite number one, which would be adjacent, if you will, to the um, the child uh, t uh, kindergarten situation owned by Mr. Fuller. Um, I can tell you that um, the requirements of the Board of Health are the most serious situations here. They have to have a sterilization room and the fit up into suite one by them is exactly what they need. Um, there would be three, three chairs, uh, two of which would be occupied by them. The third person they tell me is going to be a trainee. They'll be, they've been around long enough to actually train people, and that would be on an interim basis. Obviously, one of the major, major concerns would be parking there. I can tell you that I've been there at least 50 times in the last two months, and during the day, during the afternoon, during the evening, and there are always empty spaces in there. We are required to have eight spaces. We have provided eight spaces. On the east side, uh, I think there are five on the east side, and on the south side, uh, heading uh, towards um, Cumberland down that way, we have three. There are numerous uh, handicap ramps because of the nature of the businesses that are already in there, and uh, there are numerous handicap parking spaces. All of the minimum requirement of 180 square feet, they're all nine by 20, and uh, I can tell you that uh, their hours would be the same as they were on further down the street in Torrey Street, uh, nine to nine, Monday through Friday, and then Saturday, what were the hours, Saturday? Nine to five, um, no Sundays. That's basically um, the information I think that's, again, it's a reuse of a profession, it fits up perfectly with them. And I went out of my way before they signed a lease with an option to purchase to make sure that the other tenants were comfortable in there. 
uh, Joanna and 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 uh, Courtney went to the owners, and they went to all of the unit people that own their suites now, and everybody was not only in favor, they were encouraging that situation. I can tell you from a point of view of less traffic, if you will, which is one of the reasons uh, uh, they, that a special permit can be granted, ingress and egress has to be adequate. There are two, one almost up where the lights are, very wide, and the other one further down towards the, uh, the uh, uh, My Myron Fuller situation. Very easy in and out. Again, space is everywhere. Uh, uh, I, I don't see any reason that there would be any difficulty uh, granting a special permit for that uh, in that all of the tenants like it. I think it's good for the city. There'll be less traffic. It is a traffic signal indication there. So the traffic is going slow or stopped at most of the time. Uh, that's basically the presentation, Mr. Chairman. All right, so this is an allowed use under a special permit. And as far as the board is concerned, we do not, or the petitioner does not have to show a hardship on this. That's correct. Your Our job for this is just to determine if it's an appropriate location for that type of use. Appropriate use. Okay. Uh, several years ago, we granted a similar use on Tory Street. And this is the same crew? These are the same people. Okay. They've done so well that they're moving up and out in the world. <laughs> All right, so my question, I guess, is the experience level of the people that are working other than the new one that's coming in. Uh, have you been full-time seven years where you are now? Yes. Yeah. So you have at least seven years of experience with this type of operation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the location that you came from, who determined the hours that you were to open and close? Is that something that was left to you, or did the prior owner of that building set those hours? That was left to us. Yeah. yeah. I didn't hear the answer. It was left to them to make the hours. Are you familiar with the Board of Health having any jurisdiction on setting hours of operations for this tattoo parlor? No. I am not. No. I am not either. I can tell you the, the reuse, if you will. Um, these t tattoo artists are less intense because it takes longer for an appointment than the de dentist that they're replacing that's retired and that's left. So there's even less traffic now. Um, it, it really is a, an incredibly f wonderful fit up for them. And again, they're monitored by the Board of Health. Uh, they've never had a violation of complaint. Uh, some of the as I, as I indicated, some of the appointments, it's by appointment only, and some of them are after 6 p.m. at night, but certainly no later than taking somebody at 8 o'clock, closed up by 9. I noticed in the package there was no attestation letter from the owner of the property. Can you explain to the board uh, how comfortable we are with them and the owner of the property doing this? I had them approach them before they signed that long-term lease with an option to purchase, and either one of you can explain to the board uh, what the reaction was by the landlord. So currently they have a long-term lease? Yes, a five-year lease with an option to purchase. I guess that's as good as an attestation letter. Yeah. Okay. And they've actually put money into it already, into that lease, so. Okay. Uh, signed in May. I'm sorry. It was signed in May. Board members, any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, in your current location, how many chairs do you have? How many have chairs? Three. 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 In the current location? And yes. So it's going to remain the same? Uh, well, there's room for one more, so possibly. But Could you just speak up to the mic when you, so everybody can hear it? There are four workspaces in the new location, so uh, possibly one more at some point. But um, yeah. right now, we only have space for three, so, you know. And uh, how many clients do you expect a day in there? How many clients do you expect a day? Um, on any given day, each artist might have one client and possibly two, but it's always, uh, you know, one and then they leave and then the next one comes. So there's not like a pileup of people there at one time. Okay. And uh, are there uh, designated parking spots for your unit? Um, directly in front of, they're, they're not quite designated, but directly in front of the entrance to our unit, there are five parking spaces 
And on the other side of the parking lot, it's a big open area with a number of parking spaces. Okay. And uh, the other question I have. The five that are closest is to suite one, the original space. So that's where our people would be. It's not designated. Yeah. So um, the other question I had is signage. You can have any signs? Signage? Yes. You'll just have the simple sign that they yeah, have. There's a, a, a plaque on the front of the entrance. So we would replace that with one, you know, similar in size for our business. And I then there's a, on the, there's like a directory board or I want to call it um, on the street. So I'm assuming we probably would add something that is uniform with what's all, what else is already there. Okay. That marquee out front has all the existing businesses in there. And again, the plaque that they have on Curry Street down further is one that is, is not expensive or big at all. So uh, it's, it's an easy spit up, as I said. Okay, any other questions from board members? Everybody's good. I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official that wants to be heard on the issue? Councilor. Good evening. Um, so, yeah, I, um, Mark Please D'Agostino. identify yourself just for the record. Yeah. Mark D'Agostino, Ward 3 City Councilor. Um, I wanted to speak in favor of this uh, petition. Um, they have my full support. Um, interestingly enough, their current location is in the same building as my business is. And I can tell you that they have been absolutely fantastic neighbors. We both moved into the building around the same time. They've been great neighbors. They run a great business. Um, I'm actually really happy for them that they've uh, been as successful as they have to need to move on. And uh, I'm, I'm honestly really sad to see them go. Um, but uh, I can tell you as, as somebody who occupies the same building they're in now, there have been absolutely no issues of any kind related to, to uh, this operation at all. Um, so I just wanted to come and, and voice my support. Okay, thank, thank you, Councilor. You. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in favor? I already said that, didn't I? <laughs> we were on officials. elected officials. Any other elected officials want to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public hearing. I'm going to open it up to deliberations from the board members. Board members. I see it as a productive addition to the business climate in that area. <clears throat> I it looks agree. as though they've got sufficient parking, and it sounds like as a new customer arrives, another customer leaves, so that there isn't a... a slow jam. going as far as in and out, about as slow as it gets, really, one or two customers a day for a long duration of the art piece. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of traffic in and out. I, I drive by that building a number of times every day, and I, I would agree with Mr. Creed that the... the the parking is doesn't ever seem to be a problem if you're if they're only going to have two customers a day. I mean, there's a number of spots open in that lot mm -hmm. on a on a on a regular basis. All right. So this special permit will go with that use as a special permit. It's not like a variance that goes with the property. It goes with that particular use. Yeah. All right. Motion, motion to grant. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk? Please call the roll. Ms. Delanis. Yes. Ms. Greenberry. Yes. Mr. Sweeney. Yes. Chief Nandelli. Yes. Chair Gallagher. Yes. Mr. Chair, that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Thank you, members of the board. Good luck. The next petition is 2248, the petition of Ortilio Burgo of Burgo Homes, LLC, 44 Greenbrier Road, Brockton, Mass. For a variance from Article 3, Section 27.9, Table 1, and Article 9, Section 27.29, to construct a two-story, two-family home with three bedrooms on each floor in a C2 zone located at 664 North Main Street.
Tim is, I'm expecting uh, Engineer Azu. I think he's here. Here he is. Azu, <laughs> set it right up there. Yeah. All set, whenever you're ready, Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Attorney Jake Creedon, 71 Legion Parkway, Brockton. With me is Artilio Burgo, also known as Frenchy, and our engineer is uh, Azu uh, from Antonio um, Engineering Company in Bridgewater. Um, the locus that we're talking about is 664 North Main Street. It finds itself across the street from the U-Haul uh, business that's there. It's on the corner of Vine, uh, and North Main Street. Uh, historically, uh, I have been involved with the previous owner, um, the Ephraimides family, who are pretty famous business-wise in Brockton. Frenchie has bought that property from them. I had advised him four years ago when he wanted to uh, put a variance in there to subdivide it and do something else. I told him, you can't do that. It wouldn't fly. I then told him to try to uh, try to market the thing as a commercial lot. And when I get into what is really the only potential hardship in the situation, the size of that lot, it doesn't render itself to any viable uh, business situation. Uh, you will see uh, Azu has, has done a rendering here that indicates the entrance to that property uh, for our request, which is to turn it into a two-family up and down uh, situation is on Vine Street. All of the utilities are presently obviously on Main Street and Vine Street. Gas, uh, you can see where the water and sewer come in just adjacent to the parking lot. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a lot that has sat there for those who've been, and I think there was a big fire up there recently in that area. That lot has been vacant, as I say, for six or seven years, unable to move as a commercial piece of property. Uh, you can have in your mind, of course, that uh, if you're going to have a retail business, you've got to have turnover. Turnover causes traffic, so nobody wants to expend the money to get in there. A two-family uh, situation we feel is not appropriate, and at this stage, the highest and best use for that property, which is one of the, obviously, the zoning ordinance requirements that we try to find as, as fathers of the city and zoning boards the highest and best use for a property. Um, I can tell you that, uh, and I'd, I'd like to, with the permission of the chairman, um, recently, last year during COVID, you allowed uh, a variance for an exact similar two-family on Temple Street by Frenchy. Tremont. Tremont Street, excuse me. And I wanted to... I was so impressed by it, I wanted to, each of the members to see the beautiful building that, that's up there. The heat is completely, and the interior, the quality of the, of the kitchen and stuff that's going in there. Um, I think it's important that the city zoning board and the city fathers know who we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And Frenchie has a great reputation in Brockton, as do several other people that uh, develop property that has been vacant for a while. Um, again, Mr. Chairman, we do have to obviously prove hardship. The hardship, as I indicated, its highest and best use is no longer a commercial viable piece of property for which taxes have been paid on it for the last seven years or more without any ability to use it. If you've all, any or all of you have been up to see the property, 
Uh, you, you know that it's overgrown at the moment. Uh, it's overgrown at the moment, and this will certainly enliven and, and do a wonderful job for modernizing that whole corner. Um, again, when you figure it needs four parking spaces, um, in off of Vine Street should be no traffic hazard at all. There is a hydrant in the immediate area. Uh, if there were a fire, even though it's a modern building, if there were a fire, you could fight the fire from both Main Street and Vine Street. Um, there's almost going to be left 44% green space, which is not building, not, not building space. Uh, there are sidewalks both on Main and on Vine. Those will be maintained. Um, snow removal, I suggested to uh, Frenchie, as he has in other places, he's in the construction business, so if there's a major storm, he'd certainly take the excess off of the property, but there's plenty of room there just to, like a regular driveway in a regular single-family house, just to push it to the green space. Um, the, uh, the table situations, because it's a, a C zone, uh, really there are no requirements uh, other than that uh, when they abut a residential area 20 feet, I think we have 56 or 59 uh, feet from the, the rear residential zone. Um, uh, uh, so would you indicate the, the house itself, the size, and uh, you did the plans here. The entrance is 24 feet wide, which means cars can come in and out at the same time. All right? <laughs> All the other utilities around there, anyway. With the placement, if granted, of the building, uh, it's going to have a deck and, and a uh, porch, if you will. Uh, one will be facing Main Street, and the other would be uh, facing the rear of the property, which will be, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, that will be the entrance to the house, even though there's an, obviously the entrance on Main Street. We're going to park here and enter uh, on the Vine Creek side. Uh, neither apartment will be accessible to the other, although the entrances are similar. Uh, and there, there are both there are at least two entrances and exits, so that, but there's no immediate access by either apartment to the other one. Uh, it's a three bedroom up and down, just exactly like that picture we showed you. And the stuff that he's done before in this city has been really quality. And uh, I would hope that uh, you would consider this variance. I think that's uh, about it. Again, the lot is only a uh, little over 7,000 square feet. So commercially, you can't put a building up and have parking and have people in and out. So basically, you're saying that the hardship is that there is no use for this property as a C2 use? Yes, because of the smallness of size of the commercial lot that's been in, in existence since, uh, I think, 1930. So. Prior to this, there was a building that sat on that piece of property that was commercial on the first floor, and there was a large hall upstairs. See, the Lithuania Polish Hall years ago upstairs on the second floor. Correct. Yeah. Uh, this is a C2 zone, and the side yard setback to the property line on the south side is only 5.9 feet. Correct. 
The building next door at number 660 presently has a for sale sign on it. If something was to be built on that piece of property, they can build right up to the property line in a C2 zone, okay? If that was to happen, this proposed building now would be less than six feet away from that building. That's something that could happen. Yeah, could happen. Uh, was there any particular reason why the building was placed so close to North Main Street so that basically the steps of the porch are pretty much right at the sidewalk? Zoo and Frenchie, I think they used some of the design and closeness of that other lot and other ones they've done. But Azu, did you get the question? Uh, I yeah. Do. Okay. Uh, Okay, so when I consider the front yard setback of other properties along North Main Street up there, none of them are as close to the sidewalk as this particular proposal. That's why I asked the question. Uh, has this been, has this lot been marketed as a C2? Can you tell the board yeah, any history? Several his years, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. When Ch uh, Chuck Aphrodite's owned it, and I told him, I said, look, see if you can market it as a commercial lot. I only think he had two or three inquiries. And uh, he kept came, coming to me and said, nobody wants to invest in a commercial building that can't have a lot of parking spaces and a lot of other things. And so he kind of abandoned that. I didn't hear for him for probably a year and a half. And that's when Frenchie came in and said, I've just purchased that property and this is what I'd like to do. Okay, and just to be clear, the, the proposed building that you want to put on this lot, you're saying is very similar to the one that was put on Tremont Street. Exactly similar. Okay, we just need to understand that the lot that was on Tremont Street was in an R3 zone, which allowed for that type of construction. This is a C2 zone, which doesn't allow that. I, yeah. We understand it, but as I indicated, its highest and best use is no longer commercial. It's very good. Can't happen. All right, board members, any questions from board members? I guess my uh, question would be, that street has been hit uh, a couple of times in the past uh, decade or so with failed infrastructure and flooding to the businesses on that street. Um, my concern would be building a structure like that that's residential, I see that it has four spots, however it has six bedrooms, and under the current climate we're, we're seeing in, in real estate, more people are living together, so obviously that means more cars. My concern would be the impact to the business owners who have already been hit with infrastructure failure. Is there any communication is, between is causing, your party and the business owners? As to causing flooding or just? As to uh, talking about putting this in, not the flooding, that's already happened. Okay. What's going on here? I don't know if there's been any inquiries by any neighbors, Frenchie, were there? I mean, I've, things, I haven't, heard any, I, haven't, I haven't heard anything about flooding. Well, my concern is the parking on this project. Parking. I mean, we have plenty of parking uh, in that yard, um, but... in the impact on the business owners, that's my, just to clarify. I don't, I don't think there is. I mean, and that, that building next door, it was for sale, but somebody did buy it, and um, nothing's been done there, so I would like to... I, I don't see how it would adversely affect any other businesses. Yeah. It's... I know there's a pizza place, uh, just because I'm familiar with it, it's called the Home Cafe. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of their parking is on street. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. I pulled in, I've got a pizza right there. It's across from this, where this proposal is. Yeah. If that gets used as people coming over, people staying over, because now there's residential right there, yeah. just thinking out loud here, what is the impact to the business owners? I mean, I mean the, the businesses that are around there is the glass place. Um, and they have plenty, plenty of parking there. And then I see, I see Vine Street, but it's all residential all around there. And everybody's, everybody's got a driveway around there, so I don't see. If you've, if you've ridden in the area, the whole general yeah. area, Vine and, and around there, yeah. there are many multi-family homes, twos and threes. I think there's even a, a housing, if you will, maybe a 10-unit situation right in the immediate area. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think the... Businesses are probably used to that. I'm sure with the 
hidden coming off of Vine Street entrance. We're not going to get business overflow parking in our spaces, uh, nor in front of our uh, in front of our uh, building on Vine Street. Mm -hmm. My my concern would be vice versa. You know how the impact of other people monopolizing spots where business owners need a parking spot for their customers. It's already tight parking in there now, just because I know the area. Um, just maybe for the benefit of the board uh, to talk about this. Under 27.9, table one, what are you looking for there? 27.9, <laughs> 27, was that the? 27.9, table one. Where this, this actually now is a residential use. This is potentially a use variance in a C2 zone. So I was just curious what were you looking at 27.9 table one. I think I discussed it with a zoo and we rather put it in there in case we didn't want to have to go back anywhere if we were, if we didn't mention something. I think right. that's why that was thrown in there. What was 27.29? Remember what that was? The whole C2 use. C2 use? Yes. And it's not listed as a use in C2. No, it's so. not a permitted use. Got it. Any other questions from the board members? How long is, if I could just, do we know how long that, that lot's been vacant? I, mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head, that's why. I actually had the fire in that building years ago. It's been, ago. A, it's been a long time. years since I was involved with the lot. I'd say even, I think it's much greater I'd than that. I'd say more than that, way yeah. more than that. Like close to 20. <laughs> that I'm not must mistaken. Be empty I could be wrong. And I do remember when there was a club there. Yes. But in those days, there weren't a lot of cars, and. They did over, overdo it there. It's like the Polish White Eagles and the other ones, but uh, I mean, this would be a much better, a higher and better use. I mean, the, the lot doesn't look good. If you, come, if you come from Avon or anywhere, you, you'll see that lot empty. It's been there for years. And, and all, all people keep doing is mowing the lawn, and that's it. You know? Are they even mowing it? Doesn't look like they're even mowing <laughs> it, sir. No, I'm saying. The perimeter. Wait, honestly. <laughs> I think we should. I think it wants to grab my car when I drive by it, for crying out yeah. loud. We should make a use of it and make the city look better. I mean. uh, through the chair, Mr. Pluff, did you have something? Yeah, Chief. So that, that was about 18 to 20 years ago. We that I, I tore that down. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. All right. I knew, I knew it was quite a while. Cause I, I think the fire was close to 20 years ago, and the cap came down quite a bit yeah. right after that. And I mean, if I remember correctly, the commercial use created traffic problems yeah. up there with our and, apparatus and before, on a regular Before basis. I even purchased it, because of the I used bottle. to drive there, and I used to see, like, the homeless going in there and hide in the bush and sleep there and everything. There were trees and stuff that, yeah. that, Ep that Ephraimides cut down to make mm -hmm. it a, a flat lot, I know that. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, board members, you all set? All right, I'm gonna close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Please come up and give your na name to the clerk. Michelle Dubois, uh, state representative. I represent um, this area, and Brockton is in so need of housing. It's such a critical um, thing that I just, um, when we can build housing in a location that it is a multifamily, in a location that isn't um, right up against single family homes, I, I really hope that, you know, it, of course it's in your own judgment. What you do, of course, is always, I'm not really gonna be upset either way, but um, the housing that we have in Brockton is dilapidated. We need new housing. And this seems like it would be a good place for people to live that maybe wanted to take the bus or live on a busy street. And so I do support this, it's just especially since it's multifamily homes, not right next to a single family neighborhood. So I just wanted to register my support for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Anyone else want to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone who wants to speak in opposition? Please come forward, give your name to the clerk. Well, Scott Dwyer. 
owner of Dwyer's Glass, 658 North Main Street, also the president of the Montella Business Association. Um, in favor of this, I can't be in favor of this. We have not enough commercial properties as it is now. The residential that's behind us in that area is overwhelming. The dealings that we have to deal with with the residential areas in that area on Main Street is not enough properties to have commercial. We don't have them. There was commercial there. I've tried to buy that lot a number of times and the price was astronomical to buy it. I, I had visions for it, but that's not gonna happen. Anyways, the property next to that is for sale. They're having trouble selling that. That has been a two family apartment, not enough parking in it. The people that do live there and park, park on the street. There's fighting between the problem of home cafe and the other rentals that are in the building across the street. And then if you have father bills, the three houses, the properties that they have, all the parking on that street is filled up and it's all residential that's filling it, not commercial property. We have people that try to park in front of my property. We can't because the residents park there. I call the police all the time. They'll tell you, they'll look it up on the thing. They say, we can't move the cars. People must be staying in one of the houses or whatever. We can't move them because they're registered and they're allowed to be parked on the street. So that's the reason I'm in opposition of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition? Yeah, I'm, my name is Paul Stewart. I own the Home Cafe. And, uh, I'm What's the last name, please, Paul? Paul Stewart. Stewart. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm verbal the same thing about parking. It's tough. I mean, our customers, they, we only have the Main Street to park. And we're being pushed from one end to the other end because all the residential people are coming down parking and then they walk up the street or they go where they're going. Doesn't leave us enough parking. And I'm afraid this house going there will do the same thing. It'll create, they say they got parking, but they have people over and stuff, they all park out, out front. And I just see it being a problem with the problem we already have. It's not enough parking. Okay, so your issue is the lack of parking. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone, any elected official that wants to be heard on the issue? Councillor. Good evening, board members. Shirley A. Zach, Ward 7 City Councillor. Um, once again, we're in a tough situation. This um, lot has been empty, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, for many years, and it hasn't been maintained. I know that um, as much as we'd like it to have been, you know, it's, it's hard to maintain an empty lot. But um, I just want to give you a little history on this lot. A few years back, uh, there was a proposal to put commercial there and I believe I don't know if it had ever made it before you I know there was talk with planning and the parking was an issue and I see parking's always going to be an issue so I'm here tonight because I put my faith in you as a board to do um, you know what is right for the city um, you know something has to be has to go there I think um, it's a prime real estate it's on Main Street and um, I hope you know, it's the best decision that for the city of Brockton because we have to keep in mind the city of Brockton and having empty lots for long years on years on uh, on end isn't isn't beneficial to the city. So I um, put my faith in you that you make the right decision this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other elected official wants to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public discussion. I will now open it up to discussion among board members. Board members. One of my concerns is uh, eliminating the C2 and making it residential on a busy uh, street like Main Street. Um, you know, and also with the parking, you know, if you have visitors, uh, where are they going to put, park their vehicles? Um, now, there's just some of my concerns with this. Yeah, it's a tough clash between business and residential, especially in a in a established business neighborhood. Um, 
that's already struggling for parking. There really needs to be a garage somewhere in that area, somewhere where, you know, you can kind of have freight parking in, a, in an area. And, of course, we don't want vacant lots, but we don't want to drown existing businesses either. That's my feeling. I think I, I completely understand everyone's points on this. My, my bigger concern is how much traffic and how much parking is a commercial gonna, commercial property going to ask for as well. You know, you put a storefront in there, you put something in there, a hardware store, whatever you want to put in there, you're also going to have, and I guarantee you, they're probably not going to use any parking off street. It'll all be on street. So I, I, my, my bigger concern is obviously losing the C2 in an area like that, like you state. B but I, I think parking is going to be an issue no matter what goes on that lot. No question. Whether it be commercial, residential, whatever. I think changing the actual lots zoning is the bigger concern. I think my only uh, addition, uh, Chief, if I may, to the parking situation where it's residential versus commercial would be the, uh, the coming and going from commercial as opposed to the car vehicle sitting all day in a residential, uh, which just kind of plugs the, uh, the flow of a, of, of a business environment. That would just be my only add-on. Entertain a motion. Motion to grant. I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Delanis. No. Ms. Screenberry. No. Mr. Sweeney. No. Chief Nardelli. Yes. Chair Galligan. No. Mr. Chair, that's one in the affirmative, four in the negative. The vote is one in the affirmative, four in the negative. The petition is denied. Thank you, members. Thank you. The next petition is 2249, the petition of Rockwood Realty Trust, Post Office Box 1365, Pembroke, Mass., for a variance from Section 27.9 for relief from frontage on two of the four lots proposed in an R1C zone located at Ridge Street. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Philip Nasrella representing the applicant. With me this evening is the applicant, uh, representing uh, Rockwood Realty Trust, Jason Kennedy, together with Ed Jacobs, the engineer. <clears throat> this application seeks to address a large piece of land which is at the end of Arthur Street, uh, currently owned by the Rocky Mountain Spring. It intends on developing four residential lots, each lot satisfying the area lot size requirement. Two of the lots completely comply or in conformance with the zoning ordinances uh, including frontage, area lot size, uh, setback requirements, etc. The two other lots on Bellevue uh, are requiring relief. For, uh, they 90% comply. The relief shortage is approximately uh, by way of the frontage of 135 feet as opposed to the 175 requirement. Other than that, it's in full compliance again with setback requirements in area lot size. The um, lot, if you notice, is of an odd-sized shape, the whole lot. And even when we um, divide it and sectionize it for the house lots, they are still remain on odd sizes. The two lower lots are the ones that conform. The two um, top lots over here on Bellevue are shot the front. However, if that is an issue to be dealt with, we'll have it addressed with conservation. We also will be returning to the planning board for a definitive site plan on those properties as well. Uh, now, I know that an underlying issue which would be of concern would be what is the status of the well? 
the well intends to be capped off and abandoned by Rocky Mountain. Uh, what I have uh, with me, Mr. Chairman, and I don't believe it was included in the site um, or the documents I gave you, because I received it late, but it is of uh, September 2021. The, the well was capped in October, and it's remained in the same condition today as it was in October. But I have a letter from a hydrogeologist from Northeast Geoscience, Inc., which reads in part, the, um, by meaning the historical and natural flow and discharge patterns at the spring, abandonment should produce no significant alterations to current water levels and flows in the area and should not affect water levels on abutting properties. So I would like to address and dissuade the issue and concern about water from the wells. Again, I have a letter from a hydrogeologist. I'll be happy to submit it to you through the clerk if you wish uh, to accept it. Yep. Thank you. Again, there are two lots which are fully conforming. The other two lots seek minor relief uh, by way of the frontage, and they conform in all other regards. Uh, what we also intend to do is there is approximately 100 feet, a third of a football field, uh, we need to extend on Arthur Street to go into that area, we are transgressing over a paper street, Ridge Street, which is basically a drip pathway. That is basically the request that uh, the applicant has this evening. We'll be happy to respond to any questions. Well, yeah, well before we get to that, I, Mr. Jacobs, is there anything you'd like to add to that? And we have a, we created a cul-de-sac, which we thought would be um, far more favorable in the sense not only for traffic going in and out, but also for any emergency vehicles that have to go into that area. We create a large enough turnaround so uh, that would not be of any uh, impediment. So the cul-de-sac has to be large enough for emergency vehicles to turn around at the end of the street. Obviously, it can't go into a dead end. Correct. Uh, just for clarification now. Uh, many years ago, this came before us with a request, I believe, to develop this into seven lots. And that either was withdrawn or denied, but it went away. All right. the, the petition that's before us tonight encompasses a development of four lots. Only two lots on Bellevue Avenue are the two lots that are in question for this board. Correct, and being single family as well. That's correct. So I just want to make sure we get the groundwork laid out here the way I understand it. So the petitioner is intending to extend Arthur Street up to about where the well house is today, in that general vicinity, to create the cul-de-sac. And the, the, there will be two houses that will face on the cul-de-sac. Both of those houses conform to zoning. They have more than enough square footage and they have more than enough frontage. So we are not dealing with those two lots that are on Arthur Street Correct. and the proposed cul-de-sac. The lots that we are dealing with tonight <coughs> are the two proposed lots that face on Bellevue Avenue. And you're saying there's a hardship involved with those two, and you're requesting relief from frontage. However, the frontage for those two lots is very similar in conformance with other lots in the area, okay? All right, so now, in my conversation with the Conservation Commission on this, I was told that coming before zoning is only one step in this whole process. There is a situation here where that well has to be, or the spring has to be decommissioned. I read all the documents from the uh, state and federal requirements on how that has to be done. So the petitioner that may 
build on the lot that has the well on it has to decommission that well in conformance with state and federal regulations. Agreed. The two lots that we're going to be dealing with tonight have some wetlands in the back, and these proposed houses will not infringe on the wetlands. The Conservation Commission informed me that if this was approved, they still have a way to go with planning, and there's going to be some very arduous steps that has to be taken relative to conservation and possible wetlands that encompass part of this property, but not the area where the two proposed houses are going to be built. That's my understanding of what we have before us. I agree complete with your assessment and also agree this is the first step in a, or the second step in, in a number of steps that we have to go through before we get to the completion. Okay, the other thing that I'd like to have you address is the situation with Ridge Street. There's been con uh, conversations about Ridge Street opening up between Arthur Street and the other street that comes up from Ames Street. Um, Merton, I'm sorry, there you go, Merton. All right, so the portion of of uh, the street that would come up to where these two houses are located, that street is extremely narrow on that end. And I want you to tell us what your proposed plans are for both Ridge Street, north of Arthur Street, and south of Arthur Street. What's the plans? Well, we intentionally ran the length of Arthur Street to go past Ridge Street before we started the cul de sac. All right, before you get too far into this, I'm going to ask the board if you would agree to allow them to turn that easel around so the audience can see what they're doing. I don't have a problem with that. Are you okay with that? Okay, why don't you do that, Ed, so that they at least can yeah, see what we're talking about. Way, on the TVs. And on the TV screens? Yeah, okay. they're on the TV Everybody's good? Okay, fine then. Very good. So what are you going to do with Ridge Street? That's the question. I'll still, I can't point at the TV, so I'll point this way. So... <laughs> Can I move over? <laughs> All right, I'll do it. So, so we uh, intentionally, you can see how the cul-de-sac is going after we go out to Ridge Street. So the, the PC of this curve to go into the cul-de-sac is just on the other side of Ridge Street. So if Ridge Street were in fact improved or paved, then this would just become an intersection. So this would be great. This would be um, designed at great. And if the time came when this was going to be paved, this would just be an intersecting road. It wouldn't be going through the cul de sac. It would be going right in front of the cul de sac. So I think one of the concerns that we probably are going to hear tonight is what's going to happen to Ridge Street? Is Ridge Street proposed to be opened up on the south side of Arthur Street? or is that going to remain as it is? And if that ever was to be developed, how would that be developed? Well, we have no intention of touching Ridge Street. Ridge Street is going to stay in its natural state as it is right now. Uh, as far as it being developed, I have no idea why it would be paved as a cut-through, because there are no developable lots on it. That this, is a, this is a house right here on Arthur Street that uh, has frontage on Arthur Street, this house has frontage on Merton Street, and this is the back. Uh, parcel belongs to this person out front. Uh, our client will be purchasing this, but this lot's you know, uh, not uh, out of this project. And then the house right here. So to pave this road, uh, I can't honestly ever see it out. For the amount of money that would cost to pay that to not benefit anything. But if it did, this would be an intersection right here. It would just be a roadway intersection. And Ridge Street up here is only um, 20 feet wide on this section here. So I don't know, I don't know why uh, they would pave up the Bellevue Avenue. So if any development of that street was to take place, that would have to be done with the city, not yeah. a developer. 
So you're telling us that as far as this proposal is concerned tonight, the cul-de-sac at Arthur Street is a standalone cul-de-sac that services two lots. Correct. There is no intention to open up Ridge Street and there is no reason in any of this to open that up. That's what you're telling us. Yes, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Nope. So if we refocus now back to uh, Bellevue Avenue, the two lots that exist on Bellevue Avenue, you're seeking relief from frontage, and where the houses are going to be placed does not involve wetlands. No. However, conservation says that out in the back somewhere that there's going to be restrictions. So it can't be any further developed than what it is in no. this proposal. No, that, that blue strip you see running through there is an intermittent stream. So there'll be a, and there's wetlands on either bank, wetlands flags on either bank of that that have been delineated by a botanist. So anything within 100 feet of that will have to go in front of cons conservation. But our houses are outside of the 100-foot buffer. Okay, and my last question, I'll open up to the board. Uh, I did not hear from the attorney an idea to us on what is proposed to be built on the two lots. Each one will contain a single family home uh, adjacent. <coughs> Joe. Jason. Um, we were intending to build single family colonials around 2,000 to 2,400 square feet, three to four bedroom with an attached garage similar to this rendering. For comparison purposes, would this be similar to the houses that we see that were built out behind the uh, Cary Hill Fire Station? Are you familiar with that yeah. development? Uh, yes. I'm familiar with it. Uh, Okay, board members, any questions? Everybody's good? I think just for clarification, again, just to go back, like you said, Mr. Chairman, this has nothing to do what we're deciding tonight with the spring or those other properties. It's only the Bellevue properties, correct? Right. It appears to me the lots that they're proposing are for the cul-de-sac at the end of Arthur Street are in conformance with zoning. They have sufficient square footage, they have sufficient frontage. And it will be a dead end. And I'll save my comments for later. Any other questions from the board members? Everybody's good? All right, so listen, I know that there's a lot of people here that are interested in this development. And when I ask for those that want to speak in favor and those that want to speak in opposition, I would find it very helpful that if there is a spokesperson for the group who could talk about the issues that the group has, it would move this meeting along very well. If the spokesperson misses a point or two, I would certainly entertain anybody that wants to come up and add on to that. But I'll tell you, it'll be very difficult if everybody wants to come up and say the thing repetitiously over and over again. So just keep that in mind. So I'll open it up right now. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Hi, Chairman. I am not a um, I'm not a spokesperson. My name is Michelle Dubois. I'm, a, I'm not a spokesperson for the group. My name is Michelle Dubois, and I'm a state representative, and I live in this neighborhood as well. I just, uh, with all due respect to the chairman, I just think at minimum, if you're here in opposition, that you should come up, say you're opposed, and give your address. Because if this goes to court, we really don't want um, the other side to say not many people showed up. There was another case where this room was full of people, and Attorney Nezzarella went into the public and said not many people were there. So I think it's important that if this does go to court, that the court knows that there was plenty of residents in opposition. And I don't know how we, um, how we are respectful 
of, of the time of you and the board members and everyone else here, because I'm really grateful for your volunteerism, and also make sure that there's a perfected record, because if this does go to court, we would like um, the court to know that we had, like, if you are against this, could you raise your hand? We have a lot of people here that were opposed to it. So I don't know how you suggest we are able to perfect that um, record for um, future litigation if it happens. Okay, let me think about that. Um, Do you want me to make my comments while you think about it? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at a number of communications that came to us uh, in opposition. And there's probably a half a dozen here, okay? Uh, oftentimes, when we have something that's of this magnitude, uh, we have papers that are signed by a number of people. Um, so anyway, why don't you say what you want to say, and then obviously we can take the names of people that want to be in opposition to it. Uh, in fact, uh, if somebody wants to come up and say they're in opposition and give their name, I, I think we could move that along probably within 10 minutes or so. Uh, if it gets bogged down, maybe the best thing to do would be to have a sign-in sheet where people can sign up that they're in opposition. All right. Thank well, you let's very give much. That a try. Okay. So, uh, my name is Michelle Dubois. I'm a state representative. I represent this area. And nine years ago or so, when this came before the board bef uh, before and it was denied, I was a city councilor for Ward 6, the seat that Councilor Lally now holds. And so, um, the concern, I, under, I respect um, the, the board um, saying that this issue is about the two lots that don't have um, adequate frontage, but um, the issue is, if this gets approved here, there isn't another point um, in the process where there is a definitive yes or no. It's more of acclamation to try to make it work. So um, the, the power of the Zoning Board of Appeals is very strong, and I respect that, and I appreciate all your hard work. But with, with regard to this issue, um, as I understand it, I reached out to the DEP. I haven't heard back about if this has been decommissioned or not. Um, I think I'm hearing tonight that it hasn't been yet. But when, when a spring, um, when you build these homes, these two homes that they're talking about, on um, a spring, you di displace all this water. And when you cap and decommission a spring, you never know where it's gonna reappear. And so we have a lot of residents here that are very concerned about their property values and the fear that um, these folks' feasts are gonna be their famine because there's gonna be a spring that just erupts in their basement or in their backyard. And then there's the added concern that um, this is actually gonna cause more displaced water um, surface water onto their properties. So, um, you know, when in doubt, say no, is, is my opinion, when in doubt. And when you look at houses, or, I mean, it, they, don't meet, they don't meet the letter of the law. There is a, a serious concern about um, what is actually gonna happen when these, these foundations are sunk. And they haven't decommissioned the well legally. So, I mean, if, if, if I would suggest that they go through the process of decommissioning the well so we can understand exactly, or the spring, and we can understand exactly what the state says about how that process is gonna go, because I think what you're hearing right now is the, is the proponent, the, the petitioner's side of the project, which is there's nothing to see here. But there is a lot to see here, so why not deny this, send them to go decommission the spring, legally, make sure it can really happen, and then they can always come back to you. They can go to the zoning, they can go to the planning board and they can say we went through the legal process to get the spring decommissioned and now we want to come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals. You have so much power. This is the point in the permitting process that if you were to say no, they still have another bite at the apple, but they, you could say no, they could get their ducks in a row with the decommissioning of the spring, and then they could go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, in the Planning Board, and that's a significant change, because right now they're here with no de decommissioned spring. And it would be a significant change if they went to the planning board and said, well, now we have the spring decommissioned. We would like to take another crack at the apple. So it's hard to say that that isn't part of this proposal when um, you know, there's still a commission spring there. And we don't know what would happen in that process. So I, I, 
With the other one, you know, if you, whatever way you voted, I could see the value of having it be residential or commercial, and I respected everyone's opinion, and I could totally see it. But with this, I think it would just be a real big injustice to the property owners to move forward with this project tonight um, with so many questions about the decommissioning of the spring. And um, it doesn't fit the letter of the law. So why would we bend the rules for this petitioner when there are so many residents and property owners here that are opposed to it? So I hope that you'll vote no tonight, and thank you very much. I would appreciate some decorum. I know this is a very important issue to everyone. Uh, relative, are you going to speak in opposition? If I could, sir. Okay, I'm going to hold you up for one second. I'm just going to let everyone know what I have here in the form of letters for opposition. Uh, Marilyn Matthew, 44 Ridge Street. Uh, Margaret Lynch in the butter on Ridge Street. Uh, Taylor Houlette, 26 Ridge Street. Joe Saposkas, 34 Ridge Street. William Prebyshelskis, 143 Ridge Street, with two others with him. Ridge Street opposed, I got a letter from uh, Senator Michael Brady. Uh, the capping of the spring, uh, I received correspondence from uh, Councilor Winthrop Farwell with concerns of capping the spring, Ridge Street to Arthur Street, environmental issues. And that was it. So those are correspondence that were received uh, relative to this issue. One other thing that I want to mention is that we do have a letter from the planning board the board voted that the plan dated 322-22 was sufficient enough to allow the applicant to move forward to the definitive subdivision stage with the following conditions. The applicant must receive conservation commission approval prior to filing a definitive subdivision plan. The proof that the existing well has been decommissioned and variances are obtained for both proposed lots one and two. So just be aware if when it goes to the planning board there are some more hurdles uh, relative to the planning board. So I just want you to be aware of that. All right. Uh, Please, thank you. Yourself. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a direct abutter to the property. Uh, my name's Douglas Wedge. Um, I was passing out information about tonight's uh, meeting. A lot of residents weren't aware of it, didn't receive any, any kind of correspondence. It was- Mr. Wedge, what's your address? 65 Ridge. 65 Ridge? Yes, sir. And uh, so I wanted to make them aware and make them aware of my feelings. Uh, I do have a videotape that I quite accidentally came upon while leafleting a home. And I think it would be of interest to the board because it was a perfectly dry day and it had been dry for a couple days. The video shows in the storm drain in front of the property, two homes away from the spring or well, uh, whatever you want to call it, it was running like a river. So whatever they do with that, it's going to raise the water table. And with climate change, whether you blame it on cows or cars, it, it's going to affect. They claim they've stopped using the well since October. I don't know. But I have water in my garage I never had before already. And so I think if we can stop this where they've come to us, to the city before, several times before, at least two times, that we were all here in opposition to it. And I believe their phase one will lead to a phase two of putting the road through, and there'll be a phase three. I mean, if they're going to abandon water, which I would say is probably as equally as valuable as gasoline in the price of a bottle of water, they're going to want to make as much as they can with the land there. It's beautiful land. There's deer there. There are uh, wild turkeys. There are other animals in there. There's a beautiful walking path. I bring my grandchildren around in a wagon. Many of us walk animals through there. It's a dead-end street. And the I, I, I just think the 
concentration of homes and things in the area is enough. We have oversaturation as it is. So I appreciate your time, and I don't know if anyone else is interested in your, you want to hear from anyone else, but I thought that I should speak about that. If you'd like to see the video, it, it was quite a surprise to me. It will show basically a river running into the drain down the hill. Now that could be coming from the homes pumping out the water, or it could be coming directly from the well, but it's definitely impact from the spring or well, whatever you'd like to call it. Okay, so your issue is the possibility of water, uh, the wildlife that's in the area, and the walking trails. And also the future plans, which they will have to do to uh, use the rest of that property uh, to put the street through. It's a nice, quiet, dead-end street. So all of the above, sir. Thank you. Is Thank there you. anyone else that has something additional to add? If someone would like to see the video. No, we'll take your word for it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, my name is Richard Batakis. I live at uh, 15 Ridge Street on the Ames Street end. That's uh, on the Ames Street end? The Ames Street end, yes. Now, I took a walk through there 4.30 Monday afternoon. I went, I went walk the path. Uh, it's very wet in there, and I got the wet sneakers to prove it. And uh, if they say that well, if they want to call it well, it's always been a spring. If they say the well is capped, well, been a plumber for 45 years, and I know what a leak is. It sprung a leak because it was running Monday night, and it was running quite heavily. Okay, uh, even with all the dry weather we've had up there, it was very wet in that area when I went through. Okay, now I've also had neighbors on Ridge Street that have sewer issues, and there's one neighbor in particular, and I believe you have one of the letters, one of the people that responded to you, sir. Um, that had raw sewage backing up in their house, okay? And they have to, every year, have the city come down and snake the main drain down Reach Street, okay? Now, I don't know how they're going to run the sewer for all four of these houses. I know one of them, at least, is going to be coming down Reach Street, okay? So that's, I mean, I've been a plumber 45 years. I've yet to meet somebody that enjoys seeing raw sewage come up in their house, okay? Uh, also... Water pressure in the area. When they do, when they flush the water hydrant in front of Mr. Wedge's house every year, it's a joke. There's so little pressure there; it's it's pathetic at the uh, the amount of pressure that comes out of there. So obviously, there's a there's an issue with water lines in the area. And where is that located? At the end of his house is at the end of Ridge and Merton, 65 Ridge. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If I did not read your name and you do testify, I would appreciate it if you just sign the yellow sheet. We'll create a list of names. Hi, my name is Susan Alsop and I live at 142 Arthur Street. 142? Arthur. Arthur. It seems that everybody else is from Ridge Street, so I thought I would speak up for Arthur Street. I live just a couple houses away from the Springs and I've lived there for over 40 years. Um, I will tell you that you said it was decommissioned or capped in October. I see the spring truck go up there as recent as a week ago. So I don't know what you're talking about. Also, there is a storm runoff, and there is a lake and a river that runs down the street. Every time there's a rain, big rainstorm, I have water in my cellar. I don't know where the water is going to go. You take away the forest, who's going to soak up the extra water? Where are these animals going to go? You go out of my house in the morning, and there's a family of deer in my front yard. Okay? I saw a fox a couple months ago. I mean, you always see Tom the turkey or a couple bunnies here and there. But, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. You know, it's a, it's a fun place to bring your family and your kids. And it's, it's just, it, it just, it, it doesn't meet the regulations. If that's what you're going for today on, for the Bellevue, then don't. I've lived on a dead-end street. I'd like to keep it that way. I mean, there's so many other things, but I'm going to keep it small because I know there's a lot of other people. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Misty O'Coin. I'm at Two Ridge. Um, and I'm... Uh, two. Two Ridge. So mine is the corner lot of Ames and Ridge. And um, 
being even that far down, I still have had water issues. I've also had water um, issues where the cities had to pay me back for having a plumber come in because all the, the filtrations got caught in my um, drains and my, they'd had, they've had to come clear it out. Um, so, I mean, even that far down on Ridge, we're still having issues with water. I mean, it's insane to, to try to do, do this. I feel like I'm just opposed. I just want it known and that's it. Hey, thank you. Yep. Did you sign the sheet? Nobody has. <laughs> well, you'll start it off. All right. <laughs> yeah, I will. Just keep in mind what the board would like to hear is anything that is different than what has already been heard. So keep yeah, I feel mind. like mine was with the, the filters that. What number, Ridge, are you? 15. Hello, my name is Guy Jones. I live at 149 Ridge Street. 149 Ridge Street is the other side of Ridge Street. And having only been living there for 10 years, I've heard stories from my neighbor who was there for a long time that the water table is extremely high in that area. And my issue is when the water gets capped, where's it gonna go? Is the water table gonna get even higher? That area is a green space. Brockton has one, a large one at DW Fields Park. But this is a fairly local green space. That well has been in Brockton for over 70 years, if I'm not mistaken. And it provides shelter, like these people were saying before, for animals that live because they've been misplaced. Brockton is not known for supposedly holding deer, but now it is because they have nowhere else to go. Um, children who go through that woods with their parents, their grandparents, would lose nature. They would see deer, or the, my, my neighbor actually saw two deer and basically sat there with them for like five minutes this winter. That would disappear. It's not a good thing for people who want to build homes there, but it's also a good thing for the animals who live there and the people who live around there. I feel the other issue is the street, even though it's not going to come through, it's going to create a lot of traffic. And people like the peace that they have, and more traffic is just going to make it less peaceful. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good evening, Governor, yeah, awesome. and uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, just here to, uh, I think everyone say a lot of things that's already been said. Identify yourself. Oh, yes, so, uh, I live at 43 Wrist Street, 43 Ridge. Yes. It's uh, the middle of the below side of uh, Ridge Street. So um, I just want to give a uh, testify and evidence. So the uh, how important the, uh, I don't know if we can zoom into my little phone here. <laughs> um, so the tree is uh, the north side of uh, Ridge Street where I live. So two years ago, there was a big storm that hit Brockton. And um, without this tree, our house is going to be damaged a lot because the wind th uh, is, was from the north. And oh, I'm sorry. And like with all the tree that uh, like, it's like a small forest there is blocked and absorbed a lot of water and wind that's come down to where, toward where I live. And I know it's really, it was a really, uh, the, the forest ha, uh, has a really huge impact because even though with 
those trees still staying there two years ago, um, the wind still able to um, hit like a couple of tree dells with my neighbor, like uh, my next door neighbor live, and those tree fall down to my house, like from because of the wind from the north, and without those trees, like uh, with where they plan to do the street things right now, I think the damage going to be much higher, and maybe. Maybe this time, maybe someone's gonna be hurt or even lose their life if that, if we don't have those three like a barrier. And uh, also, I have an, a brother, a bigger brother. He is uh, disability, um, and he really need a lot of silence and cam area to to rest. And because technically, as uh, he has a GJ top, like he cannot like eat like normal person. He had the GJ top like to pump the food like directly into the stomach. And sometimes that's the, it may hurt him sometimes and he need really quiet place and peaceful. Also the nature, the, the, all the environment, the oxygen from the tree to have him rest and have a good health. Uh, and that's all I have. For all right, very Thank good. You. Thank you very much. Anybody else got something else different to add? Uh, my name is Dina Martins. I live at 47 Ridge Street. Um, I'm also here on behalf of my household. There's four adults and two small children. Um, I bought my house because it's a dead end, because there's a forest at the end. My kids can play outside. It, you know, you said it wouldn't become a cut through, but I promise you it will. They just repaved Ames. They just repaved North Cary. Ridge Street's becoming a cut through if they go right through. There's no doubt in my mind. My street is quiet. The only people that come down it live there. Maybe they're visiting. It's, I mean, I can hear the traffic on all the other streets whizzing by. You know, it's, I don't, I bought my house because it's a dead end, because there's a forest there. You open that out, then what's the point? There's no street like what we have right now. Brockton doesn't have any streets, very few, with how we live right now, and you want to take that away. And so my vote is obviously no. I like to keep my kids safe on a quiet street where I don't have to worry about a car driving up through my house on the sidewalk. So you're on the section of Ridge Street that comes up from Ames Street? Yes, I'm in the middle. In the middle, coming up mm -hmm. the hill? Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Did you sign the sheet? <laughs> I told myself not to forget, too. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll be doing the same thing. My name is uh, Bernard Volkmer. I think I'm the uh, first representative from Bellevue Ave. I live at 183 Bellevue Ave, which is uh, right next to the proposed two lots that they want to build on. And I'm not going to be redundant and repeat the same thing that everybody else has, but water problem is my issue as well. It's, it, we've, I've had water problems there right along. I've, I've been there for 60 years. And uh, capping the spring, I'm totally against capping the spring because no matter what a geologist says, there is no way that they're going to know where that water is going to go. And that water is certainly going to go into the basements of the residents in the area, including mine. So that's basically all I have to say. You know, I'm totally against the project being a representative from Bellevue Ave. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Hello, my name is Megan Ball. I live at 171 Bellevue Ave. And I just wanted to talk about, even just with these two houses, right now the woods collect so much stormwater as when we have these big storms. But still, our street is like a river. And at the bottom of Bellevue, it becomes a lake. At the bottom of Intervale, it becomes a lake. If we take away these woods and it is unable to collect this, grass does not take 
soak up as much rain as a forest does. There's going to be more flooding. We know with climate change that we're gonna have more intense large rainstorms and we should be planning to be, to to take into consideration climate mitigation now rather than dealing with the flooding of the apartment buildings at the bottom of the street when it comes up in 10 years from now. I just think that this is poor planning when we understand and we think about the impacts of our changing climate specifically on urban areas. And it's short-sighted to just approve plans that might raise the water table, that might cut down the woods, that might do this, when we know more green space and planning for bigger storms and hotter temperatures is something we should be doing as a city. Thank you. Thank you. So we've heard an awful lot about water. Is there anything different that we have not heard? Hello, my name is Stephen McGough. I live at 53 Ridge Street, and I wanted to sign this in opposition because I've lived there since around 87. I've always had water problems in my basement. I just had my cellar resealed because of that. I have a registered well that tapped right into that spring in my backyard, so I'm wondering what will happen to that well. I'm, it's not in use right now, but I got a registered number for it. And the street issue, we have a narrow street, but we're allowed to park on both sides, except in the winter. What will happen to that? Will we still be able to park on both sides with the extra traffic? Uh, that's what I'm concerned about. So Are you thank talking you very much. 53 Ridge Street? 53 Ridge Street. Brock. That would be on the Ames Street side? Yes. OK, just keep in mind that everything we're talking about here tonight is on the Bellevue Avenue side. OK, yeah. but I just want to get my name down. Thank very you very good. much. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Rebecca O'Keefe. I live at 136 Bellevue Ave. And as far as the spring being not running, the spring is definitely running. It crosses over or under, I'll say, from the spring all the way over to Field Street where there's a release at Sawtell and Field. And every morning I walk my dog and the water is just pouring out. So that's all from that spring overflow. So I don't believe that it has been capped off or decommissioned. And where did you see the water running? It's right, there's a, a pipe that comes out at the corner of Sawtell and Field Street. It's out of the, the house on the north corner. And the water just pours out every single morning. So I tell in field? Yes. The spring I'll, you, I, I'll just mention, Becky, for the last 50 years, that house has been pumping water. It's, it's a, a range. They said it was from the spring, though. Yeah, I'm just saying, uh, I've noticed for years that house has pumped water. It's, yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. All right, anyone else that wants to speak? Oh, I know you heard a lot about water, and my concern is too, like the gentleman said, I have a, I have a well, and that's my concern. What Where, will happen what, once they've capped that? What will happen to Hold on one second. Can you identify yourself and oh, where yes. you live? My name is Ivory Joe Hunter. Address? 133 Bellevue Ave. 133 Bellevue. Yes, and I've been there for 20 years. Good, thank you. And uh, that's my concern. My other concern is uh, the traffic. Uh, since they built that, uh, about three houses up in the cobra sack on uh, Bellevue Ave, I mean, uh, the traffic, like, people come flying up and down there like 50 miles an hour. Matter of fact, I had uh, uh, Mr. Larry to pull up some, uh, some stop, I mean, uh, not stop signs, some uh, speed signs and some slow signs, and none of that didn't have an effect. People just still fly up and down there. And I'm concerned about more houses being built. Is it going to be more people, you know, more traffic, more fly up and down the street? Very good. So Thank you. So far as the woodlands, when I first moved there, my two granddaughters, I used to, like, take them and walk them up there. And, you know, we'd walk through the woods, even before they built the houses up in the cul-de-sac. And uh, I would ask them, are you ready to go back? No, no, no. We want to stay. We want to stay. We want to see the deer. We want to see the turkeys. You know, so that's taking away that wetland and those woods. 
you know, we have climate control problems now. And those woods and the, you know, get, the trees give out, you know, oxygen and, you know, make it more fresh. They build new, more houses. That's just going to take away everything. And I'm very, I, I, I oppose it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have you been up once already? I'll let you touch on one more item. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. I think we've heard pretty much everything here. Okay, uh, 35 years ago, I built my house on Ridge Street. I had to move it four feet because of all the ledge that's from my house beyond. Okay, they build any houses up in there. Chances are pretty good they're going to have to they're going to run into ledge. They're going to have to do some blasting. Number one, I'd be concerned with neighbors' foundations, houses cracking, wells drying up. I have a well as well. Um, that's something that nobody seems to be touched on. And when I went walking through the woods, it reminded me of all the ledge. You couldn't go four feet without seeing a huge boulder sticking through the ground on both sides of the trail. Okay, so uh, okay, that should good. be a concern. So ledge and the possibility of blasting. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Are we? Do we have something different? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I just like to say that. Uh, uh, Address, I, please. How, everybody. Address. At uh, 68 Merton Street. And that's part of the issue is that the people on Merton Street, I just got this notice in the mail two days ago. And nobody on that street received anything other than this. And a lot of the people on that street are elderly. A lot of them work hard all day. They, I, I've been getting after them to come up to City Hall and to voice their complaints. And they're just too tired to get here. But if we had more time, I could get more signatures to come up here and let you know what you've already heard tonight, that that's an important area up there. There's, there's wildlife, there's water, um, it's shelters. Kids go through there all the time. We've been there for 21 years. We love it, you know, and I'm concerned that with this development, that's going to be disturbed. Okay, very good. Thank you. You there is to, notification. You assign, do you want me to sign my name? Certainly. Okay. There are notification requirements by the city, and it depends upon the distance that the lots are from the proposed development. So it is possible that many people on a particular street may not get notified, whereas the ones up at the top end of the street will get notified. So that is all done very diligently by the notification of the city. Is there anybody else? Are we doing? We're good? Okay, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official that wants to be heard on the issue? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, you, you may not know this, but the representative and I are uh, opening a law firm. She does the openings and I do the closings. Yes. We just divvy it up. Just proceed. Um, I'll do my best. I'll be lightning quick. Uh, no, so I, I am here as the counselor for the ward uh, to voice or echo the concerns uh, and, and opposition of the neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of different things that people are worried about, uh, you know, the range from, from the traffic and the speeding, which we've done a lot of work about, and it's, you know, still a, a, a major issue, um, to the water, which I think is probably uh, going to be the, the biggest sticking point for this uh, wherever it goes. Uh, there are people who have a lot of water in their basements, a lot of issues with the water, and just a lot of concern about this, this spring sort of being, being capped. Uh, we don't know where that's going to go. We don't know who that's going to affect. But the concern is that the, the people who change the flow of the water are not going to be the people who fix the, you know, after effects of that. They're going to be gone while somebody's still bailing out their basement. And I've got, you know, constituents here who've got, you know, more, more mechanics under in their, uh, you know, more, more mechanisms in their basement to, to deal with water than you would think necessary. 
Um, but that's going to be a big issue. And another part of this is uh, the, and this wasn't really touched on, so I'm good. Uh, the historical significance of the the spring in that immediate area. Um, most folks who have lived a long time and, and worked in, in the village uh, have memories of the spring, of you know, of going up there, of, of getting water, um, and it's it's sort of almost a, a historical site, and it's a point of significance for the folks in the neighborhood. Um, and it's it's just a very unique, interesting place that is part of what makes the city the city. And we're we're in danger of building over a lot of that and building that out, and in a rush to become more more modern or current, we're we're sacrificing. Uh, things that make the city what it is, um, but the, the the nature, the water especially, uh, some of the logistics, traffic concerns, and the the nature of the property itself, I think, are the biggest uh, objections brought forward. Um, I will, you know, leave you all to your decisions and thank you for your time. And I would just, you know, seek to say ditto to what my uh, what my constituents said. So I'll leave it in your hands as the professionals, the members of this board, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any other elected official who wants to be heard on the issue? Oh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, I know you got a letter from Senator Brady and a letter from Councillor Farwell. Uh, Councillor Texera, Texera was here as well in opposition, but he had a uh, family matter and had to go. Um, and would it be all right with you if I pass this around to anyone interested? Why don't we... Uh, what do you want to do with that? Want to pass it around? Yeah, all right. We'll let it go, Ron. Yep. All right. All right. Thank you. Now I'm done. <laughs> okay. So now there are no other elected officials that want to be heard on the issue. I am going to close that portion of the hearing. The public discussion is complete. At this point, I am going to open it up for deliberations by the board members. May I have uh, before that's open, Mr. Chairman? Just a minute to respond, because I think after you ask counsel to make comment, that would be the, part, the close of the session. But with all that's been said, I'd like at least 60 seconds to uh, make some response. In deference, I will allow you no more than 60 seconds. I'll tell you when to start counting. <laughs> 59, 58. I can respect all of the comments made by the constituents tonight. However, there were no comments made that address the issue of zoning. This is the Zoning Board of Appeals. I presented the zoning issues to be addressed. I don't discount the issues they talked about with water, with deer, with traffic that's going to uh, come out of two homes. I think much of that is specious. But this, as you indicated correctly at the outset, goes through several other boards that address the issues that are of concern. Conservation Commission, uh, site plan review. Those will address all of those issues. I'm asking this board respectfully to retain their argument to zoning, and I believe I have presented that which justifies a zoning variance on those two lots. The other issues are not to be dealt with tonight, and yes, there are, I counted, 30 members. That's a lot of people in opposition in the city of 100,000. So I don't discount their emotion, their fear, but it's not up to any board to worry about the historical site, climate control, I think was well beyond us. I respectfully request this board to retain their comments and decision making to the zoning issues, whether or not we have satisfied that. Very good, thank you. Thank you. No, the hearing is closed. We are now deliberating. Board members. Um, earlier, they mentioned that there was a, a proposal for seven lots. You're going to have to speak louder with that siren. Earlier, um, it was mentioned that there was a proposal for seven lots originally. Yes, many years ago, and, yes. Uh, how long ago was it, um, were these four lots created? Do we know? How long ago was that? The four lots? The four, four lots. No, it's the, no, the four lots that we have in front of us. Do we know when those were created, or? The four lots? Yes. That's new. Okay, because my question is about the hardship. I mean, if they created the lots, would they be creating their own hardship? Your comment. You know, see, if they, if they have drawn the division lines for the lots, gone to planning, 
I think our representative from planning can probably fill us in that they have reviewed the plan and allowed them to move forward to zoning. We cannot create lots. The planning board has to create lots through subdivision. Mm -hmm. So what they have created requires two of those lots to have relief from frontage. That's what we're looking at tonight. And maybe our representative from planning can embellish that. Oh, that's, that's, that's correct. It's for those two lots. Um, however, my feeling on it, I'm familiar with the, the street. I sold one of the newer colonials on there maybe a dozen years ago. Um, I think it was sold with a sump pump, there's ledge, there's all, you know, all, the, all they're saying is correct. Uh, my feeling in this area is just because we can, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we should. I think I'll leave it at that. I didn't catch the end of that. Just because we can't, you know, doesn't mean we necessarily should, uh, you know, considering all the, the elements, in, you know, inclusive of this, even per the zoning. Back to the fact, though, we're, we're voting on the frontage of the Bellevue addresses, correct? And that is all? Yes. I think these things could be cleaned up before we see it, and it could be sent back to us, so. So I, I guess the option for this board is if this is granted to give them relief on frontage, there are still a number of steps that have to be done before a building permit is ever granted. The, unfortunately, the well that we've been talking about tonight isn't even located on the two lots that we're looking at. That well is located on two conforming lots that are going to be located on the cul-de-sac at the top of Arthur Street. So, Mr. Chairman, if I can just, Mr. Chairman, if I can just ask you that. So, the spring will come out on the ones that already have the correct frontage. Is that correct? The lot that the spring is located on yes. is located on a lot that has sufficient frontage and sufficient square area. Okay. So those two lots that they're proposing on a cul-de-sac at the top of Arthur Street, the way I see it, those lots are not in our purview. Those lots are going to be controlled by the planning board and the Conservation Commission, and in my conversations, there is a lot of hoops that have to be gone through in order to uh, secure that well, to shut it down. I read some documents that are very definitive on how that's done. It is a very extensive process to shut that down. I had the same concern that it, it's like almost like a whack-a-mole that you plug it here and it pops up over there. But according to governmental agencies that deal with this stuff, there is a method that can be used to control that well. So what we're hearing tonight, I think, is people that are telling us that they're seeing water and they're associating with that water that's coming from the spring. We can't make sure that that is in effect. That water could be coming from somewhere else and it's running through that land where the well is located. And the Conservation Commission has told us that the back land behind all of these before uh, four lots is under conservation control. And there's going to be a lot of requirements associated with uh, conservation issues. Mm -hmm. We really don't know that if this area is developed, if it would do away or make much less the water runoff that's going in there right now. This could change a lot of the way water runs up there. And there's certainly, there must be some standing water that the Conservation Commission is concerned with that's up in the back land that can't be touched, can't be built on, that they will have full control over. So, again, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that a lot of the things that we heard tonight relative to that spring really don't impact or, or directly affect the two lots that we're looking at. We're looking for a hardship that's related to the frontage of those two lots. And what I heard was the hardship is the shape, topography of those lots, uh, the conformance perhaps of those lots with other lots in the neighborhood. Uh, we heard a lot of things. 
the traffic that we heard about on Ridge Street, uh, particularly on the Ames Street side, uh, if Ridge Street is not opened up to where these two houses are going to be built, and they, that can't be, it, it's too narrow, but from Arthur Street, there is no reason that anybody would open that street up. If that street was to be built, it would have to be built by the city. There's no developer that's going to build that street because there's nothing there to build on. So if the city decided down the road that they wanted to build that street, I would think the proper place to go then would be to the city council and say, we don't want our street opened up. But some of the issues that we've heard, personally, my opinion, some of the issues that we've heard on Ridge Street, particularly on the Ames Street end, are certainly a long, long distance from the two lots that we're looking at for relief from frontage. The other issues up there relative to water fall into different, different agencies. So is there any other comments from board members? I guess my, my concern is continuing the process with outstanding concerns probably of this magnitude. So one, one of the things you can do is you can vote this down and not allow them to come back here until all of those water sit Quiet down back there. Quiet down. If this is voted down, they would not be allowed to come back before the board until all those other issues were addressed. That's right. an option. Right. That's an option. But keep in that mind be... that there's two issues here. One is the frontage on two proposed lots, and the other one is the concern of what's happening with the water from the well. So if the board members are uncomfortable with either of those issues, there is a, an alternative. Uh, whatever the board wants to do, it's your vote. It's just my opinion that these things should be cleaned up before we advance a, a project like that. Yeah, I agree. I think this is too big of an issue, uh, you know, All right. until we know for sure that it's uh, straightened out. Uh, I'll make a motion to grant. Second. Well, motion has been made and seconded to grant. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Delanis? No. Ms. Screenberry? No. Mr. Sweeney? No. Chief Nadelli? No. Chair Galligan? Yes. Mr. Chair, that's one in the affirmative, four in the negative. All right, the vote is one in the affirmative, four in the negative. It is denied. Okay, return from recess. The next case, Ms. Hodges will be sitting in for. I will be taking the place of uh, Chairman Galligan. Uh, petition of Douglas A. King, 115 Main Street, 1D Northeastern Mass, for variance form section 27 10, table 2, section 27 32, and section 2757. Two, if required to renovate an existing structure into a two unit apartment building use and construct a 10 unit apartment building lacking side yard setback with insufficient floor ratio and operate a parking lot less than 10 feet from a proposed medical facility in a C5 zone located at 48 North Pearl Street. The presenter. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, thank you uh, for the board again. My name is attorney Jim Burke and I have offices at 48 North Pearl Street in Brockton, Massachusetts. I have the pleasure of representing Doug King. Uh, we're gonna present this uh, petition uh, for uh, relief by variance. Mr. Buckley is here with Bay Colony Group, uh, the uh, uh, engineer, and he's going to assist. Uh, the numbers seem to be very familiar and there's a reason for that. Uh, this property, in fact, uh, has been my law office since 1979. Uh, I purchased the property, uh, did a renovation, uh, the building was built in 1900, uh, and it has been uh, actively in uh, the, the business, the practice of law, uh, 
and a law office since that period of time. Uh, at uh, some uh, few years ago, it became apparent that uh, thinking about uh, next steps, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to look for uh, a best methodology for selling the property. Uh, I have no intention of leaving the business. But uh, interestingly enough, COVID seemed to change things because direct contact with clients significantly was altered in the process of what we learned from the whole COVID experience, including uh, your, your Zoom conferences. Uh, and in doing so, uh, I, I put the matter out with uh, uh, Bill Callahan and, uh, and talked with a number of uh, uh, realtors and became clearly aware that the, uh, the model that I had worked with for so many years does not work in the city of Brockton anymore. Uh, you cannot take uh, what is existing as a, a residential structure and have a, a bucolic uh, homey office uh, that, that is uh, uh, a, a feat that has not been accomplished. Uh, a number of attorneys, uh, one of them that's here today, I know has come before and basically said the opportunity to sell and develop and rehabilitate for professional offices is gone. And they're exactly correct. So uh, I, I, I discussed this with Mr. King and Mr. King came in with a proposal. He had some ideas and I'm happy to sell it to him. Who is Doug King? Doug King is someone I've known and represented for about 40 years. Uh, he's one of the best builders in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, he's built approximately 1,500 single-family homes. Uh, he's built the luxury uh, apartment complexes. He's built uh, medical office buildings. Uh, he's built commercial. He's built residential. And he does, he does it with quality. Uh, he does what he says he's going to do, and it's a great finished product. Here in the city, two of the abandoned buildings, Bixby being one of them, uh, he renovated for the Brockton Redevelopment Authority a number of years ago. He just got through a renovation for the uh, old high school in the town of Easton uh, that was converted into condominiums that wound up getting an award by Massachusetts Historical Commission. He's also been awarded uh, by uh, New England Builders and by uh, Better Homes and Gardens. Uh, he, he does and has continuously built quality work and has a great reputation. So. Uh, he purchased the property uh, roughly December of uh, 20, I guess, or uh, 21, I'm not 100% sure, and I have re uh, rented uh, since that time. What he seeks to be able to do now is to take a facility that's in an economic empowerment zone uh, in, in the city of Brockton and convert it to market rate housing. And when I say market rate housing, he'll go over the uh, rental structure with you, but it's, it's, uh, it's steep. Uh, you're talking about uh, $2,025 uh, per unit for rental, and that's because it, in fact, is a, uh, a luxury model with luxury appliances uh, and is going to be a well-maintained facility with very short access to Route 24. Uh, in, in, in looking at this project, uh, he uh, at first was thinking of uh, taking the structure down that is my office, which is in substantial need of repair. As I indicated, it's a 1900 structure built in the turn of the century. Uh, it uh, does not have uh, uh, handicap access. It does not have uh, items that uh, are built to code. Uh, and we'll need substantial renovation in order to make it work. Could it make it work with the zone that it has, which is a C5? And the answer is no. Uh, we talked about the fact that this model structure does not work for professional offices, which is exactly what C5 entails. Professional medical, professional realtors, professional insurance. Uh, it, it just is a structure that will not work. Uh, it, it's an economic liability for that. Uh, the structure would have to be removed, which creates economic impacts that make it totally uneconomic to proceed. You next look at the available issues that uh, are available, and that uh, is banks. Uh, will a bank go there? Absolutely not. Uh, lending institutions, 
Basically, what else does it allow? It allows nursing home. Well, the, the failure of, of, of the nursing home adjacent to us is, I guess, a model to explain to us that that's not a use that will, in fact, function. So basically, one of the arguments that we're presenting uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals is that there is no functional utilization under the C-5 statute that will work. Whatever he sought to do would require someone to seek a variance. Because it's in an economic opportunity zone, Mr. King will commit uh, to building this luxury uh, apartment complex and keeping it at least 10 years. Uh, he's 76, 77, uh, which is a commitment. But uh, he will keep it, he'll hold, because that's essentially what he's done throughout his entire career, which is build and hold. Uh, the, uh, uh, the design uh, is, is, is been uh, somewhat remodeled because he's going to leave the structure in the front and he's gonna to totally renovate it into two apartments. Why do I think that's important? I think that's important because when you talk about streetscape, when you talk about what you will visibly see as you go down North Pearl Street, that will be the structure. You will not even be able to see the 10 unit building that he's gonna build, which will be, and, and many of you have been there, parallel in, in, in sighting to the existing nursing home. Uh, the lot goes that far back. So you're gonna have that structure parallel to the nursing home which basic, basically will not be within the view, of the observation view uh, of the streetscape and will not impact uh, the surrounding neighborhood. It's interesting, but I heard uh, Councilor Dubois talk about the need for housing in Brockton. And one of the things she specifically said that I, I thought was relevant was, it's great to create housing that doesn't back up to other people's homes. This is exactly what would happen here because you have that facility that was a nursing home that is now going to be a medical use facility. Uh, that structure wraps around their parking to the rear of the structure. Then you have the cemetery. That 10 unit apartment building will have absolutely no impact, visual or otherwise, uh, on the surrounding neighborhood. There is a traffic analysis that's been presented to you, a detailed one from Gilligan. It's clear that based on their determination, they have identified that the number of trip traffic will have an absolutely de minimis impact uh, on the uh, existing traffic on uh, North Pearl Street. Will it have no impact? Of course not. You can't develop and have no impact, but will have absolutely a minimal impact on the area. And, and that's, that's, I think, extremely significant and relevant because if you, in fact, if, if, if someone came and was opposed and suggest, let's make it a bank, the bank traffic would far exceed what you're talking about in terms of the residential use. A medical office would far exceed what you're talking about in terms of traffic uh, for a residential use. Uh, if you're talking about uh, any of the uses identified within the allowed use in a C5 zone, it would substantially have a greater impact than what is designed here uh, for this specific project. I am absolutely confident that if this board were to grant uh, the requested relief before you today, they would absolutely be able to be upheld on appeal if someone chose to go in that direction. Because yes, there is a hardship that meets the statutory requirement of 40A. First, whether there are circumstances related to the site, soil conditions, uniquely affecting the property and not the zoning district to hold that creates a hardship financial or otherwise. Within that umbrella, one of the issues is if you have a significant standing structure that creates economic liability for a particular development, that, in fact, can create a hardship. That's what you have here. It, yes, it can be remodeled, but it cannot be remodeled in an economic way to use the uses that are allowed in the zoning ordinance. Next, you have the size of the structure in terms of the lot, the lot size, the width. There is an impact 
uh, based on the narrowness of this lot, the length and narrowness of the lot, because you couldn't get a bank to use that kind of an access. You couldn't get uh, a medical office to use that kind of an access. It just does not create the viability that you need in order to make that work. In addition, uh, many of you are, uh, live in the neighborhood, uh, have, have been by, and I know you've probably heard the pounding that's been going on for the last three to four weeks. They have been hammering ledge uh, on the uh, uh, Braymore site continuously, and the ledge goes right up to uh, the a lot line of this particular property. There is absolutely no question that there is ledge that exists on the site. Ledge is, in fact, one of the conditions that impacts soil conditions that runs to the issue of a variance. So I think that the design of Mr. King uh, in creating the two units in the front with, with, with a site that meets the required parking, uh, with a site uh, that I think uh, somewhat uh, uh, professionally as designed and assisted by Mr. Buckley, uh, creates space for the FedEx truck, for the prime truck, to make the internal loop, park, deliver, and leave, which uh, made uh, adjustments so that the interior front space of the entryway of the 10-unit building will be open and vacant. So if, in fact, emergency personnel from the fire department, from the EMTs, have to make a return, they're not crawling around cars. They have a direct access to the front door, and they have the ability to uh, make uh, a removal of someone whose help in is, in, is in need. Mr. King has developed this exact same model uh, in the town of Rainham, and it has been incredibly successful. I'm going to let him speak to that. One of the reasons is it's a different model. It's only two stories. But in, the, in being two stories, each unit will have this own separate entrance. Uh, each unit will have a balcony of sorts. It is an entirely different concept that's proved exceptionally successful for Mr. King, and he intends to recreate that with the board's permission in the city of Brockton. The access to 24 make housing an absolute perfect utilization. Uh, the economic empowerment zone talks about housing. Uh, it is, in fact, a, a, a great blend. It will uh, it'll match the mixed-use neighborhood that exists already and will have basically minimal impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, I, 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 the relief that we requested uh, was fourfold, and I'll address it very briefly. First, it was relief that uh, you grant the uh, use variance to allow a residential use uh, in a commercial C5 zone for the renovation of the two family, uh, which is the office building. The second relief is that you grant the exact same relief as requested uh, for the 10 unit, uh, which would be a separate structure to the rear of the property. There was also a requested variance for floor area ratio. I am informed uh, by Mr. Buckley that that is a Scribner's error, that in fact his plan has sufficient floor area to meet the requirements of the revised ordinance of the city of Brockton. Is that accurate? So that in fact is some relief we do not need uh, to seek from the board this evening. The last is, and you know what? You learn something every day. I discovered this when I was looking at it. You can't take a a driveway within 10 feet of a medical use facility or a medical clinic. Uh, that's in our revised ordinance. And in fact, uh, we are uh, just outside of that in terms of the design that was laid forth. It's an interesting concept because I don't even know what you call what's next door to me right now. Because uh, it may ultimately be a uh, a medical clinic, but it is not uh, one now. Uh, it, in fact, is just something under construction. So uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the gift of safety, uh, we added that in terms of a relief uh, that we should need. Uh, 
Okay, if I could, Mr. Buckley, would you go ahead and walk through the site uh, for the zoning board? Could I just real quick, uh, yes, Mr. Can, Burke, sir. before we, you, you said you do not now need the floor area. That's correct. What, do you have something that's documented that states that, or is that just word of mouth you're giving us now? Explain why. It's actually on the site plan, the uh, floor area ratio, the table in it, and the city of Washington, the zoning requirement is the maximum floor area ratio is 0 0.5. Uh, it's currently about 0 0.7, and we're going up to about 0 0.3. So it's, it is on the table. Okay, thank you. access to this facility is through a driveway coming over here on the south side and then there's about a 10 car parking lot paved in the rear here. What we're proposing is to leave the existing facility here and run a gentleman, 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 gentleman. Uh, Sir, could you actually move the microphone over to the microphone here and if we can move the easel over if that's easy. Right, I can you. I can point from here for my big heavy green. Thank you. So Tom. the um, just to start again, so the existing facility will stay there as shown on the plan, and what we'll be doing is expanding the access. Right now, the only access is over here on the south side, and there's about a 10-car parking lot in the rear of the building. What we'll be doing is turning this into a loop. So you'll be able to come in one way over here on the north side. There'll be parking just to the north of, this, of the, uh, the building. And then there'll be additional parking in the rear here between the two buildings, and then you'll be able to go out the right. Um, as was discussed earlier, the, we've set up parking so that the entrance to the building, which would be the main front entrance, will, will not be blocked by automobiles. That, that will be actually the um, handicap accessible space, and there'll be a, an eight-foot uh, lane there so um, emergency personnel can go in and out without weaving between cars. Over here to the right, we've set aside a space um, where, you know, if it, depending on the time of day, if it's in the middle of the day, there's gonna be a lot of spaces open, but depending on the time of day, if a, of a, an Amazon or um, FedEx truck comes, there's a space right here that they could park and go either into this building or that building. There's 24 parking spaces on the site that will uh, serve the facility, both the facilities. And as I said, they're spread out some here on the north, a couple here on the south of the building, and then the majority in, in between the two buildings. The site's gonna be served by municipal sewer and water. Um, it's right out there in the street. The soil will be coming in over here on the north side. The water comes in on the south side. And this building will be served by, will be sprinkler because of the, um, the size of the building. The, we've run a, a template for a, a ladder truck through here. And actually, if you have the, the site plan set, I think it's sheet 7.0. And that, we, so you can see a, a ladder truck can make the turns coming in the site, going through um, for emergency access. And that's the largest vehicle that would probably be coming through there. We've also done a landscaping plan that's part of it. And I, I think it's sheet six, much, I'll tell you. Sheet, sheet uh, the landscaping plan, or the, the last two plans, is the landscape and lighting plan. So the last sheet is the landscape plan. You can see we've put landscaping around it. Um, and then the lighting plan, we've made a, a uh, conscious effort to minimize the lighting. The light poles that go on around the site are only 10 feet high. They're LED, 
And then we have some lighting on the, the buildings, which we have to have it over the entrances. That's code requirement. And again, that's an LED lighting. We've kept it low. It's only at 12 feet. And the photometric drawing that's the next to last sheet, I think it's LT1. That is the, um, we'll show you. I know it's hard to read because I, I, I was looking at it earlier on the small sheets, but it, the photo, the, uh, it's designed so that there's no wash off the site or very, very minimal off the site. And I think, um, I think that's it. All right. With the board's permission, I'm gonna let Mr. King address uh, the, uh, the zoning board. Thank you for uh, meeting with myself and our team. And uh, we're looking forward to develop 48 North Pearl Street in utilizing the opportunity zone to make the two, the front office, as Jim said, into two units and the back into 10 units of five one bedrooms and five two bedrooms. The design that we're using in Raynham and want to use, uh, plan to use in Brockton, as Jim said, each unit has its own entrance. So the first floor units have doorways in and the second floor units have an exterior door with an internal stairway that leads up to each unit. Each, all the units have their own balcony or patio. And uh, in Rainham, we've just finished the third phase of a 225 unit uh, rental complex. And the Rainham community and the people that are living there uh, love the layout of the buildings and the opportunity to live in them. Uh, this opportunity zone, I think, is important to take advantage not only for the developer, but the community and the residents, because it to utilize the incentives of it, also, as Jim said, you it's important that you keep the buildings for 10 years to uh, utilize the tax benefits for developing and doing the uh, requirements of building in an opportunity zone. We're, uh, our office is less than five miles away in Easton, and we're building in all the surrounding communities, Brockton, Avon, Easton, Sharon, Raynham, uh, F Foxborough, and we look forward to uh, doing this development and we're proud of what we build and we want, we only want to build what we, I myself would want to live in. And uh, we look forward to doing this and thank you for letting us come before you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, I guess in closing, uh, as I said, these are gonna be high-end units. Uh, it's gonna be market rate high-end units. Uh, I believe that uh, we have identified for you uh, sufficient uh, hardships that qualify under uh, Master Law Chapter 48. Uh, I'm extremely confident that, that we have. We're gonna ask your uh, assistance in hopefully granting the requested relief. It is progress, it's measured progress, and I think it'll blend in very well with the community. The impact and increase in the tax revenue are substantial uh, and in fact creates additional housing uh, for people to come into the city and enjoy the benefits that Brockton has. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but uh, other than that, I think we're done. Mr. Chair, if I, if I may. Questions from the board. Um, the square footage, these are one and two bedrooms. The square footage again of these uh, approximately? 700 to 800 on the one bedrooms, 1,050. Thank you. Um, I got a all question. Units have, uh, stackable laundries on the hall. Oh, okay. Uh, and with the COVID, the, the separate entrance uh, is really uh, something that uh, people like. Yeah, no, sure. Thank you. Um, I got a question, but the first thing I'd like to mention is that these plans aren't acceptable. Uh, everything here, I have to look at it with a mic with a magnifying glass. There's no reason why you couldn't have each one of these on a separate page. <sighs> Uh, these are very, very difficult to read. Is that the, pl is that the plan filed? Yeah, look, if you look at page A2, 
Well, you know, we, we uh, as part of the process, we, we do file large size plans uh, for, and that we, we, we filed because of that reason. Uh, so that uh, the zoning board and individuals would have the ability to use that as a reference. So we did file full size plans. So usually for the other cases, we have the larger ones, but here, the, these were very difficult to read. But, yeah, they, are um, difficult to, they, are dif they are difficult to see, especially as I get older. But my question was uh, for the parking. Uh, do you have anything for um, guest parking? A guest, guest parking? Guest parking. Well, I, I think that is in the ratio of two cars. That's, that's part of the ratio of two cars, is that includes guest parking. So we meet the requirement of the ordinance, and the requirement of the ordinance also included within that ratio that uh, the guest parking would include two. Okay, and the other one, I don't know if um, uh, the chief can answer this better, but with the uh, emergency vehicles, them, to me that appears kind of tight. Yes, um, I have a couple of questions about that, but yeah, it appears kind of tight, and that's to me. It seems like you're assuming everybody would be parking perfectly in their spots. So uh, I was just thinking, if you had, you know, you have what ten units here, if you needed multiple uh, emergency units coming in there, uh, would that be possible? Uh, I think the chief might be able to address that better. Yeah. So I, I, a couple of questions I have. What is the length of the rear building? I can't see it on the plans. To be the quite length honest, the length of the rear building. Length of what? Rear building. He wants to know the dimensional length. Approximately 90 by 80. Okay. Was it? Was there any thought of to putting a driveway next to it down one side, at least one side of it? it Sorry. <laughs> I, I think I think the chief was asking. Was there any thought of putting a driveway around the side? Yeah, around the major building? Now I know it's tight, probably all the way down and around because of the uh, because of the land you have there. Uh, but was there any thought of putting one at least on well, one side had... because it limits our access greatly? Are you talking for fire engines? Fire apparatus. Yeah. So what we had uh, envision is this uh, this walkway here. Yep. Should be uh, six feet wide, but four feet on each side to do uh, compact gravel with a little bit of wood on top, so that the fire engines could go right down. Yeah, we would never do that though. It, we don't. We do not move on anything that we don't even move on residential paved surfaces. We don't turn around people's driveways or anything like that because of the weight of the trucks. So, it, just a question: if that was thought to have gone down one side, because that's m my biggest concern is the emergency vehicles around that building and how they would get the, the just my reach of a ladder alone. I can't get to the back of that building, um, and. The turning radius, I, I know you said you've done that study, and I, I, I question those studies. I've talked to Scott Ferrier himself about this, and I, I, I think sometimes that everything has to be perfect for that to work correctly. So those are just some of the concerns I have, and multiple emergency vehicles at the time would be a bigger issue because now you're coming behind a building to get to that building with multiple cars. So I, I, I echo the point of uh, Mr. Lanus on that. Well, I, I, it's not perfect. Uh, and one of the hardships is the size of the, the, the lot. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that, uh, uh, or at least I've been informed that in firefighting, uh, you, you need to try to create access. The entire parking lot of the Braymore comes right up to the back of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, you could bring a, a, a structure, a ladder truck, you could bring a firefighting equipment into that parking lot, which is open, and have absolutely eased access. Uh, until they build something. <laughs> so my point is, I, we can't, right here and tonight, we're discussing your plan. We do that, Mr. Burke, we do that quite often. Yeah. So don't, I'm not being a wise guy. What I'm saying, though, is and we do do that a lot. The problem is they have access to their own land. They can do what they want. We can't, we have to worry about the plan we have before us tonight for your property. That's the concern. So I understand what you're saying, though. Questions from the board? Seeing none. Okay. How wide access are you talking? Well, the driveway side that you'd have probably like 12 access. feet wide. What's that? 12 feet? Yes, at least. I at think least. Could, that uh, would be something that we'd have to. I think to... we could make that walkway 12 feet wide. But would it be? Do it. Would it be? Would it be commercial grade asphalt that yeah. we can put no. on there? Yeah, we, we, 
it would be compacted and it'd be uh, some kind of pavers or something that will. Yeah, but pay, we, we need it to be built up like a street. Or maybe concrete. We need it built up like a street. Like I said, we don't, we don't turn fire apparatus around or do anything in people's driveways or anything for that reason, because we've destroyed people's yeah, properties I know, before. I know, I know. We can have concrete on each side and then in the middle uh, have grass, like a two-foot grass strip that would be. Yeah, I, I'm not, I, I don't, like, I, I'm looking at what's obviously before me right now. And these are just concerns I'm just throwing out there. I, I, it's hard for me to now envision. I have to work with the plan that's been presented before us, obviously. Well, we can, uh, we could get, well, we can get you back to here. So I guess what he's saying is if it were we can make it happen. the variance uh, granted, then uh, he could comply with it. Understood. Any more questions from the uh, board? Me? Any, oh, I just asked any questions of the board. Good? Okay. Um, anyone here in favor of this project would like to speak? Anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this project? Good afternoon, sir. And if you could just state your name and your address for the uh, sure for the record. Um, Paul Ware, 161 Healy Terrace. Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the residents of Brockton Heights. And uh, just to provide some supplementary information to the um, submission that was made for the, uh, for the May 10th meeting uh, that was postponed. So there was a, a presentation that I sent in, submission I sent in that um, you should have all seen, hopefully by now. Um, uh, for me, this is uh, kind of deja vu because about two years ago, less than two years ago, <clears throat> I was here presenting on, the, on behalf of the Brockton residents opposition to um, the project that was being proposed for the old Braymore uh, facility. Uh, both, I was here for both the Finance Committee and the City Council meeting. And um, that project was two five-story apartment buildings to be built on the Braymore uh, facility. Um, and so here I am again doing the same thing for uh, a two-story apartment building, uh, or actually two of them. Um, I, think the, I think the main building is gonna be two stories. I'm not, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, and, uh, just as this, the previous zoning overlay, which, which it was called, uh, was, um, was intended to change the usage characteristics for that Braymore parcel of land. Um, basically what this is, is a, a, a request to change the usage characteristics for the, the, Berg, the 48 North Pearl Street property. And so basically we think it's, it's a zoning change. It's not just a variance, it's a zoning change. And for, the sim for similar reasons that we opposed the uh, project that was being proposed on the Braymore property, uh, we're opposing this one as well. And um, I'd like to just go through a couple of, uh, or several, not more, more than a couple, of issues that we have. And I must say that uh, actually some of the things I've heard tonight from the presentation are a little bit different from the, from, seem to be a little bit different from what the plan was that was actually submitted with the application. So I may have some uh, outdated information uh, in terms of the numbers, but I think the points are similar, even uh, without those, uh, even with those uh, discrepancies. So first of all, um, there are some legal descriptions and terminology that, that have been used in the application, but there really doesn't seem to us to be a substantial hardship, especially a financial hardship involved in this particular request. Um, you know, the petitioner is a, is a self-described successful developer, and um, I'm not sure if he, if, <clears throat> excuse me, he actually owns the property at 48 North Pearl Street right now or is intending to buy it. But regardless, uh, the property is zoned a certain way and to buy it and then claim a financial hardship seems a little bit disingenuous, especially from the kinds of things that, that the developer, the petitioner has developed before. 
um, because there were, there were some risks in buying that property as a as a um, a C5 zone, and then trying to turn it into a uh, residential multifamily zone. Um, we don't believe that the the petitioner has provided any substantiation that the utilization of the property for a permitted use is infeasible and that there are no other uses that it could be put to. I know he's given some examples of banks and medical facilities and that sort of thing, but I'm not sure what the proof is that those can't be, that lot can't be used for those kinds of purposes. There are plenty of other examples on North Pearl Street of small medical facilities uh, I haven't actually gone out there, none of us have gone out there and actually measured those to see what the square footage is or the lot size is. But it seems to us that there are, there are plenty of uses that it could be put to without building an apartment complex on it. And um, there's also a claim in the, in the application and, and Mr. Burke uh, said this that um, the buildings would be in harmony with the existing neighborhood. Um, we don't believe that's founded in, in fact. The, uh, there are no other multi-unit apartment buildings in the, vicinity, in the vicinity of this property, in the close vicinity of this property on the west side of, 20, of Route 24 and on North, on anywhere on North Pearl Street. Um, the immediate area is now zoned R1B with some small segments of C5 and C1 zoned. And um, we believe that the apartment building, I'm, I'm not sure actually of the design and whether it's gonna be seen from the street, but we think it is. And if it's not seen from the street, it's certainly gonna be seen from the other uh, area behind it, which is uh, like Rangeley uh, Avenue. Um, and we just don't feel that that's, that's in harmony with the rest of the neighborhood at all, uh, which are single family homes. And as I said, some of the C5, C1, uh, small business uh, commercial uses. Um, and in addition to that, uh, to those major shortcomings, uh, there are some things that we just don't know about and have not been presented. Uh, first of all, what are the demographics of the people who are going to be living in the apartment? Um, I, tonight I heard the pricing uh, of the apartments and what it might be. But we really haven't heard anything about what the intended use of the apartments are for, the, for, the, for people. What kind of people? What, what do they do? What, where do they work? Where do they come from? Where do they go? Sir, just, to, just so you're aware, this is a zoning. It has nothing to do with demographics or any of those na things in nature. Okay. We're, we're, we're voting strictly tonight on the zoning aspect of it. Okay. Just, so, just to stay in the, we've got to stay in our lane here. No problem. Okay. Um, we heard a little, some details about the parking, um, and I'm not sure that, uh, that what Mr. Burke said is actually the case in terms of how many parking spaces are allowed. Uh, I think that, that just needs to be verified in terms of how many parking spaces there are for the number of residents that are there. It is, my, by my original estimation of the original plan, uh, it was as, I believe it was 18 bedrooms total. Um, and so the number of parking, lot, parking spaces for that, for the residents and then for the potential visitors uh, just needs to be verified and understood. Um, and we're also not sure what has been the uh, review process uh, in terms of how, and maybe this is not the concern of the zoning board, but maybe this comes afterward. I'm not, I'm not really sure about the process there, but um, what is the uh, apartment building, what are the apartment buildings going to require in terms of city services? And what are the apartment, what are the people in the apartment buildings going to provide in terms of benefits to the community and benefits to Brockton? That stuff all comes at tech review and such. So Pardon me? Go, that, that stuff comes after, sir. Okay. Um, so lastly, let me just address the, the traffic assessment report. Uh, and very similarly to the uh, traffic assessment report that was done uh, for the, uh, two years ago for the uh, Braymore proposal, we think that the traffic assessment is inadequate and, and fundamentally flawed. 
what happens is it narrowly studies the area right around the entrance and exit to that apartment building. But the nature of North Pearl Street at that point is at the intersection of Pleasant Street and North Pearl, um, there's a tr there are tr is a traffic light and there's a lot of congestion in rush hour. And so bypass traffic occurs on side streets in Brockton Heights and the streets of Carlin Road, Healy Terrace and Nylon Road are the major ones that are used as bypass. There is some on Bower and, and Allendale and Lovett but, and Cashman. But those three that I first mentioned are the, are the primary ones. And those, are, those streets are used in the rush hour by the bypass traffic um, getting around North Pearl and Pleasant. That has totally, that was never taken into consideration in the previous proposal. It was not taken into consideration in this traffic assessment report. And so we believe that that's, that traffic would be exacerbated and the, uh, the hazardous conditions that that traffic poses to, the, to the, those streets would be exacerbated by this project. Um, we also believe that the number of outbound and inbound trips, again, can, using a, an 18-bedroom uh, plan, as, as we thought it was, um, was just too low to be believable. And so, um, again, not knowing the, where people work and how many people have cars and how many people are driving to work uh, I don't think, we don't believe that the traffic assessment was, uh, was, was really uh, adequate. And then in addition to that, there were 19 figures in the traffic report, cited in the traffic report that were never in the public record that we could, that we could find. So um, I guess bottom line is that um, we don't believe that the, the prerequisites for a variance have been satisfied in terms of financial hardship, um, and in terms of being in harmony with the, with the surrounding community. Um, so um, we're strongly recommending that the board deny the application. Thank so, you, sir. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Uh, just for the record, uh, in regards to, <laughs> you're also, in regards to the hardship aspect, it's not a financial hardship, it is a land topography, soil, and the like. Sir, if you have something else to add? Yes, I'd like Okay, to. thank you. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my esteemed city council is back there. Uh, I uh, live at 16 Island Road. My name is Steve Morris, and uh, that's about 300 yards from the front door of uh, Mr. Burke's property, uh, now Mr. King's property. Uh, I can see the front door. I can see the backyard from my property, so it is not hidden from my view, you know? I, uh, I really like Mr. King's uh, properties. My uh, mother and father-in-law live in Quesit. Uh, I lived there, they just both passed away. And my, uh, my aunt and my mother and my uh, wife and I are kind of the caretakers for them. That's a lovely property. It's beautiful, it's sprawling. I believe that that has adequate parking that has access completely all the way around for fire engines or anything else. It has delivery access and all that stuff. I just don't think that this property is large enough for all of that, you know? It's, it's got a Mr. Uh, Mr. Brooks uh, property out front there, you know, that's uh, uh, house, basically, you know, that he's used. It's a very good tenant you've been. You've been the quietest neighbor I've ever seen, you know. Uh, and Braymore with a nursing home. They were very quiet, too. That was a nice place. I was actually originally hoping that Mr. King would buy the whole thing because it was that's what Wood Partners had put in to put those two five-story buildings in there. Uh, I was Plenty of access that, around those buildings for emergency vehicles. Yeah, exactly. I was hoping that he would do that and build a place like Cuisin, you know, with an over-55 community. <sighs> Because they're very quiet, and really, Quisit is an over 75 community, if you will, you know. But uh, that didn't happen. I'm just worried that, you know, I was very upset about the traffic thing, because that's my thing. You know, I'm a numbers guy, you know. <laughs> and uh, traffic uh, assessment. You see, the, uh, the medical facility is moving in, is opening in August, allegedly. They're going to have 80 employees, 50 of them during the daytime. So they're all going to be 7 o'clock in the morning going in and out of the facility. This uh, place with all of these people is going to add another, I believe, 20 to 24 prime time uh, cars to the uh, Pearl Street, you know, and uh, that's a really tough intersection. Unless something is done with that intersection, it really doesn't handle traffic very well right now. 
I don't like, I do like the idea of a residential property going in there. I can see C5 properties going in there too, you know, that, that would have worked. It really would have worked. Uh, but I, I just think this is kind of a small parcel of land for something this large, you know. If the house was taken out and this parcel was put in there, it might work, you know. But with uh, the house and that parcel back there, whoa, that's crowded. I was kind of upset at the uh, proposal for the, uh, the entrance road because I thought they were just going to use the driveway that's existing and maybe buy some land from the medical facility to widen that and do something there. They're, they're going to take out all these 60 to 80 year old trees that are beautiful there. They, are beautiful. they absorb the sound from the pummeling of the ledge that, that's going on from the medical facility right now. And they're beautiful. And I walk the uh, cemetery every day. So <laughs> I know the property. I go right by Mr. Burke's property, Mr. King's property now. And uh, that does absorb the pounding and it absorbs the noise. Those trees are God's gift. They really are. They're going down. That's the driveway right along the stone wall there. So now there will be nothing blocking the noise from their construction <laughs> to reach that whole neighborhood. Yeah, I know the cemetery people don't mind at all, you know, <laughs> and the residents of the cemetery don't mind at all. But uh, the residents in the neighborhood are going to have a lot more noise. I just, I just think it's a little oversized, you know. Uh, if the house was gone and the other property, maybe that would do, you know. It just upsets me, again, with the traffic assessment. When Wood Partners was going to build those two five-story buildings, they were talking about 60 to 80 uh, trips during rush hour every day. It's like there was 450 people going to be moving into there. They're going to have 20 people to 24 people moving in there, and it's a uh, it's, uh, high end. It's going to be two professionals to every bedroom probably <laughs> that have to go into Boston to work. You know, I would just guess that, you know. So that does, I just don't like the, the lack of integrity with traffic assessment. That I know everybody doesn't want to talk about traffic, but Pearl Street is a tough place. We have Good Sam Hospital there with ambulances going up and down there all the time, and that is a bottleneck. That Pearl Street and Pleasant Street intersection is a bottleneck. We have the Hancock School right down the street the other way. You know, I, uh, I just think if this was... Uh, Maybe if the house was gone and just that, because I love the properties that he builds. It's just, they're phenomenal. They really are. The facilities are awesome. And as I said, it was responsible for the safety of my uh, in-laws and the other one. But uh, I just, uh, it's just too big, you know? Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. And anyway, I'll speak to, oppose, to a speaker and oppose opposition. Seeing none, any public official? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. My name is Patrick Cloney. I'm one of the owners of 34 North Pearl Street. <clears throat> I was asked to come here by the tenant to vehemently oppose the, uh, the, uh, the proposal on the table today for uh, uh, my uh, direct abutting neighbor. The main issues come down to its own Z C5. I think by evidence of us going in there right now, there is a marketplace for C5. Uh, in addition, we have neighbors, individuals, uh, single-family houses that abut us uh, on two other sides. We've had a number of meetings with them, and we've tried to appease all their concerns by moving any of the um, uh, loud noise apparatus, like our emergency generator, um, supplies coming in and out in the uh, ambulatory um, uh, uh, bay to that far side of the property, which would be directly abutting uh, the proposed uh, site. Um, so we think that's in direct conflict of what we were trying to do with the existing neighbors and would probably cause problems if they uh, were allowed to move forward with a residential property that um, there'd be some activity there that we'd, uh, we'd have to uh, deal with going forward. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, the other major concern they had was the location of the, of the new proposed building um, is super close, as you can see from, from the sketch, right? Um, where they, the, the bedrooms that they're proposing would actually be looking directly into patients' build, uh, patients' rooms, and the tenant has great concerns about that. So for those reasons, they vehemently oppose this. Sir, could you just state your name and what your position is for your tenant? What, you, what, what role are you playing for them, for, for the, for the abutments? Sure, my name's Patrick Cloney. I'm one of the owners of the building. The tenant is Boston Medical Center. Okay, so you're the owner of the actual old Braymore. Correct. Boston Medical Center is renting from you. That's right. 
Correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Anyone else in opposite? If, if I like anything we're going to hear that might be different, okay? If, if you'd like to speak, ma'am. If you could just state your name and your address, please, for the record, yes. ma'am. My name is Theodora Silicaris, and I'm at 134 Cashman Road. I've lived there for over 30 years. I've watched the traffic increase year by year. Now, it wasn't so bad with the Braymore. However, I'm really anticipating a big traffic jam with the, with the apartments. First of all, we're talking about building apartments next to a behavioral medical center. You're talking about one and two bedrooms. When you're talking about two bedrooms, you're more than likely gonna include children. Children next to a medical facility such as that. Bus stopping there, children coming off. Traffic, incredible. Every time a bus stops, the traffic stops for miles, and you know that in Brockton. Children have to cross streets. They have to mingle. They stop. They, they don't go to their apartments right away. Where are, they, where are they gonna go? Next door to the medical facility? Secondly, when you're talking about traffic studies, who best is to have a traffic study than the, than the residents that live down the streets there? I've lived there for over 30 years. You're talking about traffic studies aren't gonna be a problem? They're a problem now. They cut through our streets. The 25 mile an hour thing didn't do anything. They're just speeding along. Can you imagine later? Secondly, when you're saying it's a hardship and nothing else can go there because it's too small, I beg to differ because if you go to the Webster Bank on Torrey, whatever street that, that's on, it's the smallest bank probably in Brockton. They have no problem. They're right next to McDonald's. They do enough business. They do it very adequately. Now, what's going to happen with a two-bedroom unit? They're going to have guests, maybe more than one overnight. Where's the parking going to go? Down the streets in our homes. Who's going to stop it? Are you? No. It's easy to say there's going to be no hardship when there's a hardship now because you people don't live there. Would you like it next to your house? I doubt it. Why us? Why? Why, why do you increase the mess that's already there that's going to be there? I didn't major in math, but I use common sense, and it tells me that this is not the appropriate site to increase what's, always, what's already going to be a hardship with a medical facility that shouldn't even be there because there's a school down the street. Anyway, I oppose to this. Use your common sense and judgment. If there are so many loopholes here and there, in my estimation, it should not exist there. Unless it's a clear-cut situation, you don't approve it. End of discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else would like to speak in opposition? Anything different? Um, sorry, I'll make it fast. I know it's. So if you could just state your name and your address, uh, ma'am. Yep, my name is JC Almeida, and I live at 139 Cashman Road. Thank you. So basically, I'm, I just echo everything everyone said, but. Um, with all due respect, you said that um, the parking spaces were enough for the residents and for visitors, and I really don't yeah, believe please, that to be the case. Hey, please yeah. talk to the chair. We're ta ta you got to you can't direct towards them. Uh, You're okay. making the case to us, ma'am. Okay, so I really don't think that um, two parking spaces, if I did the math correctly, is enough for all of those residents because let's say if it's two, uh, two, um, two bedrooms, that's two people with a car, and we know living in Brockton, if it's a two bedroom, there's most likely four people that live there. So really the math doesn't add up to uh, residents plus visitors, and also $2,500 or more for market rate, it's a great location, but you're also next to that behavioral health clinic. Who is going to pay 2,500 to be literally like right on top of a behavioral health clinic? I just don't see that as being market rate for the next 10 years. It's just, I, I just don't see it happen. So the traffic absolutely is an issue. Um, the parking will be an issue. Everyone will be parking on the side streets. And I, you know, I hope he's right, but I don't agree that, you know, he'll get market rate for these apartments for the next 10 years. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else want to speak in opposition? 
Okay, seeing none, any public official that would like to speak on the matter? Council, if you just give your name and address, that'd be great. Good evening, Tom Minicello, 49 Marjorie Road, Brockton, uh, Ward 1 Councillor, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, I'm in opposition to this project. Um, I'm, always in, I'm always in favor of a project that makes sense with regard to fitting in with the zoning, the right location, the right neighborhood, development. However, in this case, we have a, a basically, I would say, this is a request to do anything everywhere. It's, it's, it's asking you to change the zoning law for this area that does not exist. A variance, as, as was mentioned earlier, is, is, in ordinarily, is ordinarily based on a unique, a unique shape of the lot, topography, um, something of that nature. What's, uh, and, and that a neighbor or a, 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 a people in the neighborhood and area can also build or do. No one in this area adjacent can build an apartment building and put in residential use in a C5 zone. No one. What's being asked for here is not a change to the ordinance. It's basically a change to the law. And, and, that's, not, uh, and that's not appropriate. What I would also mention is that a lot's being mentioned about financial use. Well, I don't know what extensive studies have been done, but um, that, that property has been used as a very successful law office for a number of years. And but for COVID, um, I, I believe Attorney Burke would still be using the law office. Not to say that you know he can't sell it or another lawyer might not want to purchase it, an accountant. Um, I don't know what extensive extensive uh, research has been in, has made to make, make someone believe that you can't use that property as a professional C5 zoned property that it's currently been used for in, in a successful manner since the 70s. Um, with regard to the uh, adjacent mental health center uh, hospital that wants to move in, um, I also think you have an issue there. As was previously stated, that property was designed so that on the side adjacent, the northern side, next to where the 10 uh, unit building wants to be constructed, there's going to be an ambulance bay, there's going to be shipping and receiving, there's also going to be a generator. The ambulance bay is going to have ambulances with backup alarms that are going to arrive at all hours of the day and night. And the mental health, the BMC mental health facility specifically located that area so as not to disturb the residents. It's on the side of the building north adjacent to the cemetery and there are no re residential uh, units there. So if that building is, is built, the 10, the 10 unit structure where it's proposed to be and the parking lot encroaches to that back northern side, what I would argue is it's gonna create a nuisance for the pe new people that are gonna be tenants in that building because they're gonna hear the, the uh, shipping and receiving bay and they're also gonna hear the ambulances, backup ambulances, and, and from time to time, the generator. So I think you're going to end up creating a nuisance that doesn't exist for that neighborhood. But uh, for those reasons, I, I would be against this project because I really feel that this needs to be a change in ordinance. It needs to go through the ordinance process. It needs to go through the city council, and it needs to be um, well vetted before you do an oversweep and, and change C5 zoning and opening up to residential, which currently... Is not the proper use, and I don't see the, I don't see the legal basis of it. I just don't see the unique feature, basically um, financial use and hardship. Generally speaking, not uh, not the uh, basis for a variance, but I, I just don't uh, agree with it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public official that would like to speak on the matter, Council Fowell? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Councillor at Large, Winthrop Farwell. I live at 94 Brainmore Road in Brockton. Uh, almost every time I come into the Zoning Board of Appeals, I consider myself a neighborhood protectionist. I stood shoulder to shoulder with Mr. Ware and others when there was a 150 or more apartment building proposed for North Pearl Street. Uh, in my political career, I have always prized integrity as being the number one trait you need. I can't stand here before you and tell you that I oppose 10 apartments. I just can't do it. There are three words on the 
seal for the city of Brockton, education, industry, and progress. Sometimes there's pain with progress. Sometimes when we make progress and we bring in housing, there is gonna be a little bit of traffic. But 10 apartment units, really? If the sixth largest city in this state can't handle 10 apartment units, and by the way, if any children were to live there, we get about $14,000 per child in educational reimbursement from the state. If we can't handle 10 apartments, and if I stood here and opposed it, what message would I be sending to other people who would like to invest in Brockton and open businesses? Mr. Chairman, I think you raised the most salient point, public safety and fire apparatus. But I just can't do it, folks. I mean, if there's a political price to pay because I don't oppose this, I'll pay it because I'm not going to misrepresent to you that I think that this is some catastrophic project that's going to sink the west side of Brockton. And as far as the demographics, you're quite right. We don't get into that. I don't care who moves here. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they make for money. If they're willing to be a participant in what we do here in the city and contribute, I'll take them. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Councilor. Any other public official that would like to speak on this matter? Seeing none, I'd like to close that section of the uh, hearing and open it up to discussion amongst the board members. This is an interesting side of the city. Um, it's kind of declined one uh, project that was a larger scale, um, and something else went in there by right, medical facility. Uh, I think. And even now, some people don't like what's going in there now. So here we got a quality builder. There's some opposition, of course, and there will always be. However, um, it is a very small project on, a, on the grand scale of things. That's my opinion. Yes. Now, for myself, um, I'm not in favor of especially on a busy road like that, getting rid of the commercial uh, lots and changing them to residential. Here we have the C5, they want to change to residential. Um, I, I think there is a market for that. Uh, obviously, because next door you had the, um, was it on 34? Um, 34. In the parking, I think, uh, I think that's a major issue. I, I know they're only required, um, uh, they have enough that's required but you're going to have uh, guest parking. You're going to have, uh, uh, you're not going to have anywhere for them to park. Um, and for the emergency vehicles, I'm looking at the, what we have in front of us. It looks like the lane they have coming around is about as wide as a parking spot. You know, so I, I think they're trying to uh, cram too much in a small lot. Um, it's a nice project, but I don't think it's for this area here. Uh, that's just my thoughts with that. We do see the demand with housing coming in, and uh, if it, you know, it seems to be rep repetitious. So, if we shut this down, I'm sure we'll see something else similar. So, yeah, I, I just we, think we this just is... have to be careful about, you know, how we, what our our message is going to be in, in terms of progress. Which I just uh, think this is say. ten units is too much. On this area here, um, you know, the downtown area, you have uh, parking garages, train station, buses, you know, so you can kind of get away with uh, limited parking spots. Still need a lot more garages downtown. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So my question is why this particular design of unit design? because that brings the concern of safety and the fire engines or if anything happens, does everything have to be clustered? I've seen different developments throughout the city and it's a line or it's split. Why this particular design or is there a way to do this more safely? Do you, I don't do you have another, do you have a question for the petitioner, do you want, would you like me to reopen just so they can answer a question for you? Is yeah, that what you're we, getting at as are amongst us? So yeah. could you, would you, Mr. Burke, would you mind answering? I also know why the design you chose for that specific site. 
with it being so narrow, you know? Sir, uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. King, if you wouldn't mind just standing up just for the record, appreciate that. Thank you. I thought this design would go the 90 feet in parallel to the nursing home and the cemetery, then the 70 feet over. And I thought the layout with the separate entrances to the five second floor apartments and the five first floor apartments was the most successful way to do it for the tenants mm -hmm. to enjoy their own privacy and use, to make it more like a home. And it's only a two-story building, and, I, and the nursing home, whatever they're doing there, which I'm not sure, but it's definitely a three-story building. So even on the roof line, you're going to have the larger building and then the two-story building and then the cemetery. So you, I think it will blend in better where the lot's longer than it is wide. Okay, the lot's roughly 400 feet deep and 105 feet wide. Okay, thank you, Mr. King. Does that, does that clear up your question a little bit? Yeah. Any other discussion? I just think on the public safety aspect of it, what's really required on that aspect is the access road for the uh, apparatus, if the chief, uh, chief could probably confirm that. So, I mean, obviously, they'd be willing to work with that situation. I think to the point of uh, Mr. Lanus is that changing of the uh, C5 is a, is a concern. Um, but I think, you know, maybe a stipulation with some sort of access to that back road, paved road, commercial paved road, not um, would be in consideration for something like that. I, I understand the pavers and the grass in the middle. I know we have to make it look nice, but I think, you know, to be able to get fire apparatus to the back of that building is a bigger concern. So I, I I'd, I'd, I'd enter a uh, stipulation if you'd like to add that on, if that was something that the, the, the board would, would be interested in, and then we can move to vote, or if there would be more discussion on that, please. Uh... I think that's probably the basic uh, address the public safety concern uh, that you have. I think that's probably the, the least we could add on there. Well, but, uh, we talked about a 12-foot uh, uh, road on what would be the, the south side of the larger building, of the of the building in the back, access to get a piece of fire apparatus, ambulance, whatever the case may be, towards the rear of that building, up up into the actual back wall of that building, the most western portion. And in, is that in, in by laying that down, the public aspect, the public safety aspect of, of this, uh, you'd be comfortable with? Is that is that what the plan is? I, I, I'll be quite honest with you. I I, I I'm not. I think I, I think we got turning radius issues there and stuff. I've never been satisfied with the engineering that comes out of any of these, quite honestly, because I don't think they're. I, I think they, I think they always err on the side of perfection, and you're never going to get that in one of these parking lots. But you know, we have to go with what the engineers say. You know, I, I can't just go on hearsay uh, or what I feel per se. But um, but I think. I think that gives us better access to the back of the building. I still think we have an issue with the turning radius and the loop getting around, but that's a whole other animal. So I'm going to write down a commercial grade road from front to rear, most westerly portion, as, as, a, as a stipulation for the vote. That sound right? Yeah, I think yeah. I think you got it. Uh, any more discussion on the matter? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mr. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do I have a second? No second. Mr. Uh, Pluff, would you please? Uh, Certainly. Uh, Mr. Lanis. No. <clears throat> Ms. Greenberry? No. Ms. Hodges? No. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. And um, Chair Nardelli? Yes. Mr. Chair, that's two in the affirmative, three in the negative. That's three in the negative, 
Two in the affirmative. The petition fails. All right, the next case is 22-51, the petition of Zequan Zhang, 738 Bach Street, Swansea, Mass, for a special permit from section 2729, subsection 3G, for a proposed restaurant with drive through use in a C2 zone located at 683 Belmont Street. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Jake Modesto, my address is 120 Washington Street, um, Salem, Massachusetts. What's your name again? Jake Modesto, last name M-O-D-E-S-T-O-W. M-O-D-E-S-T-O-W. T-O-W. Very good, thank you. No problem. I'm the civil engineer on the project, here representing the applicant, 683 Belmont ST LLC. Uh, application in front of you tonight is really a special permit for a Starbucks facility located uh, at 683 Belmont Street. Uh, I have in front of you is an aerial exhibit prepared by my office, uh, just simply, simply showing the, the property highlighted in yellow. Uh, it's map uh, 18, lot 160. This is just over a 7.6, uh, 7.1 acre parcel. Now, the, the subject uh, area that we will be developing uh, for the Starbucks facility does sit in the front of the property along Belmont. It's just under a half acre, so a lot of the plans you'll be seeing uh, to come are really going to talk and speak about that half acre. Now, the parcel does have, it was the old uh, stop and shop facility. Um, what we're looking at in particular is the, we'll call it the vacant parking lot in the front of the facility, um, just oriented the board a little bit more. The uh, high school is just south of the property. Uh, we have a, ta a Taco Bell just north of the developer area. It is on our parcel. And then just south of it, as you go along Belmont, there is the McDonald's. The property is serviced by a singleized intersection, uh, Memorial Drive that more or less tees up um, adjacent to, we'll call it the developable area on Belmont Street. The property is located within the C2 commercial, uh, general commercial district where drive throughs with outdoor seatings, uh, and restaurants are a, a special permitted use. Um, and really what the applicant is looking to do is to reinvigorate this underutilized parking area. There's over 502 parking spaces distributed throughout the shopping center. From a code requirement standpoint, this facility is overparked. So what the applicant is looking to do Nine square foot Starbucks facility. This will have a patio area located to the north of the property. And just for the board's uh, orientation, we've taken this and slightly rotated about 45 degrees. The top of the page um, is now what was, uh, we'll call it north. Um, so we've taken a little orientation. So now Belmont is more going perpendicular across the bottom of the page. Uh, and then again, aerial overlay. If you're following along in the package, it's be sheet C4. So we have the northern portion of the, the, the building area, which will be a, a patio area. This will be fully enclosed with about a 42 inch high uh, fence. Um, it's really just a, a screening fence in, to encapsulate the uh, patio area. There'll be outdoor seating. Uh, we will have a drive through facility located on the east side as you look at the plan of the building itself. They'll have the capacity to queue up to 14 uh, 12 by 20 spaces going in and through, um, we'll call it around the perimeter of the property. Now, it's about 300 linear feet of, uh, of queuing space available on the developable area we're talking about, which is just under, um, just over a half acre. Um, so that would be able to easily fit a lot of some of the larger vehicles that we would see on the roadways, such as an F-250 would very easily fit within that 12 by 20 space that you're showing. Um, so it has capacity to handle up to 14 parking spaces um, with that, that analysis. On site today, uh, sorry, what we're proposing is 15 parking spaces, 14 are required by code. If we look at this on a, a micro scale, just kind of the developed area that we are reconstructing, but if you look at this on a macro scale, which we are is in a larger shopping center, 
um, we are significantly over park. So even with the removal of some of these parking spaces, there still will be over 471 parking spaces left distributed throughout the, um, the facilities. Um, so from a code standpoint, 310 with our property and counted would be required. Um, so we still have an abundance of parking. Should be noted too that really what's gonna happen is we have this existing, uh, we'll call it cross access that goes across the north part, part of the developed area that we're showing. And this creates an interconnect inter interconnectivity between some of the commercial uses that borderline the front um, of the, the actual uh, parcel and some of the neighboring parcels. So just going back to the existing conditions aerial, you can see it running almost parallel with Dunlop uh, Street. So that access point gives another relief to people who are working within the shopping center who may not only be using Starbucks, but may be using some of the other facilities when they enter the site. Um, from, a, from a bulk standpoint, we are complying with all zoning re regulations when it comes to uh, the proposed um, new building uh, within this front uh, parking area. Uh, we are proposing, it's a modern facility, uh, so we're proposing necessary lighting around the perimeter um, of the actual facility itself. Uh, there'll be an abundance of landscaping, there'll be 13 trees wherever possible. We've scattered them throughout the, um, the property uh, and as many as possible have been used to screen the seven foot high trash enclosure. It'll be a masonry construct uh, at the edge of the uh, queuing uh, lane for the drive-through facilities. Uh, there is a slight increase in the area that we're talking about of impervious surfaces. Uh, as part of the application, we'll be implementing an underground infiltration system just from a quantity standpoint, um, we will be reducing overall rates going off the property. Um, however, you know, we'll be handling this through a, a 21,000 gallon uh, system that'll be buried underground. These will be chamber systems um, and it's typically used in a lot of commercial developments. I think one of the bigger things when we, we look at developments like this is traffic um, and the applicant hit this head on uh, with the proposed application. So what my office did is we actually prepared traffic counts. We went out there, we analyzed the facility uh, as it exists today. Um, we counted it uh, during December, during the morning peak hours, the midday peak hours, and then all again uh, on the weekend. So it was a Thursday and then a weekend um, Saturday um, analysis. And what we did is, is we, we put those, those calculations together in, and built in what would be uh, what we reference as Institute of Transportation's engineers, their analysis for a Starbucks facility, which is a coffee user. Um, should be kept in mind that a coffee user like this in its general location, it's based to have to be next to high traffic uh, roadway networks. So for Belmont Street uh, has over 11,000 average daily trips going through in, in um, the actual quarter itself. So for a facility like this, this is ideal for Starbucks. Um, it's ideal as well from a traffic standpoint, it's because Starbucks and a coffee user, it's a passerby. Um, so essentially what it's saying is that the trips on the roadway will be utilized. So from a new trip standpoint or additional trips from this, um, Starbucks is a load, is, it's a load generator. It's, it has a, a number of additional trips that will be added to the actual intersection itself, but to the roadway network, it's minimal. If you're looking at this from a, an overall standpoint for the additional trips uh, created uh, that are not uh, passerby, it'd be like one to two a minute, which in the grand scheme of things, you'll never be able to uh, notice um, at that intersection. It is a signalized intersection. So as much as possible, the, all the movements will be controlled in and out of the property. There is, we've, we've done also a queuing analysis. I think that's always the question that comes up with facilities such as this. Um, and when it comes to queuing, just talking a little bit about that, um, it comes to actually the service time at the window. It's not the order time, it's the service time at the window. So if you look at that being the, the holding point to the entire analysis, in the industry we're seeing between 30 and 45 seconds at that window as an average of service time. So what we did is we analyzed that. Um, we picked, we'll call it the happy medium, we'll call it a, a well operating facility, which Starbucks is. And with 37 seconds of service time, that would be able to handle approximately 15 cars. Um, now, you know, I said 15 cars at 12 by 20. Keep in mind, that's a much larger space than some of us may drive as far as the actual uh, vehicles. So some people don't necessarily give that friendly courtesy gap um, as they pull into uh, one of these facilities. So we still do think there's ample parking on site. If for some reason there's a situation 
uh, where we would build up into this facility itself is two lanes. Um, so if for some reason it would back up um, into the facility, which you know, from what we're seeing, it would not happen uh, from all the analysis we've done based on industry standards and what we're seeing through Starbucks throughout the country, uh, there would still be the ability to enter uh, into the site. So from an egress uh, standpoint, uh, there would be um, no change to how it operates today. And just from an architectural standpoint, I'm just gonna walk the board through what the building will look like. When you speak, can you just grab that microphone? You can carry the microphone right over there if you oh, have to. No. It's okay, I can talk from here. Um, but it's essentially what we're looking at is a 22 foot high uh, building. It'll be made up of three different primary materials, starting from the base, uh, we will going up uh, with CMU block, these will be colored. And as you continue up, uh, you will have an EFIS backing and then a wood siding, uh, which is the treatment you'd see um, basically at the, the front uh, as you're facing it from the, the cross access drive as if you entered into the site. Um, so we're trying to use as much different textures. The reason we do not extend the EFIS down is we, that's where a lot of the customer interactions is. So we want to have a more hardy material. So we've, sorry, Starbucks has had bad experiences uh, with customers and the EFIS interaction. So they brought up a lot more CMU block uh, throughout their architecture. You'll see that nationwide in a lot of the facilities uh, moving forward. So looking at this from a, um, an overall special permit standpoint. Um, overall, there's a consistency with, with a lot of the operating uh, facilities up and down adjacent to uh, our actual proposed development. Uh, we comply with all zoning requirements. Um, as we, we, took, uh, we took a deep dive into, which is the traffic analysis, I can continue to dive into that a little bit more if the board wishes. Um, there is no impact to the ingress or egress to the facility, and there'll be no effect to the ingress, egress, or the roadway network surrounding the property. Um, and as far as stipulations, um, we, we comply with all other uh, zoning requirements um, set forth for a restaurant user like this. I believe there are none. Um, so that is generally the proposed application in front of you in the special permit request. Lloyd, any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, outside of tapping into the roadway, um, are there any other financial or demographic measures in locating a Starbucks? Are you saying the selection of the site uh, yeah. for Starbucks? I'm, I'm not privy to all those. I have noticed that a lot of these sites have been selected, you know, from, from what my experience is high traffic uh, roadways. Um, as far as the other components, I don't have that market research. I guess what I'm trying to allude to is some people take it as a standard of measure for development in a, in a town or a community. Mm -hmm. Do you find this to be true? Um, I, I can't comment on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Where does the front of the building face? So the front of the building, um, the main, we we'll call it the main entrance. The main entrance is located to be on the west side of the building, um, so it closest to the parking lot area. There is an alternative access point uh, that you can actually enter through the patio area as well. So there's a secondary point that people can get in and out of the building from within so the patio. what you call the front of the building would face west towards that roadway that comes in off of Belmont Street? Correct. From the Belmont Street side, we'd be looking at the end of the building. Uh, if you want to look at that uh, that way, this is a unique scenario because we have a situation where really we're, we're looking to more or less bring out as much architectural features on four sides. There is no true back of house. There's no true rear of the facility because no matter where you are, you're going to be able to see this. Um, it's great that you say that, but this facility that faces Belmont Street, it would be nice if there was something architecturally that made it look good from Belmont Street. To be very clear, we're talking at, it would be the middle left section. That would be the section that you'd be looking at from Belmont Street. Mm -hmm. uh, there will also be a fence that will be screening one of the doors that you're seeing there. That'll be a white fence um, that'll actually screen that. In addition to that, what I did mention before is we have a, 
an extensive amount of landscaping as much as possible within that front section. So there will actually be from the base down, as you're looking at from Belmont, there will be a continuation of landscaping. Um, so you'll have a different breakup as much as possible. That from an, a layout standpoint is what would Starbucks be is their back of house. Uh, and it's very hard to bring in, um, I think some of the architectural features that you would typically see in this scenario. Um, as much as possible, I know they like to incorporate different breakups in their, in their facade, but that's a location that we, we cannot add, you know, we'll call it a different additional glazing. Yeah, I understand that, but I, I want to just let you understand that we've been kind of a victim here in this city of a lot of developments that ended up with masses of blacktop, uh, very little uh, vegetation, green space, so that was why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. So basically this building will face west. So when you pull in that driveway, you're looking what I'm going to call the front of the building mm -hmm. and the end of the building faces Belmont Street. It would be nice if something in your architecture would make that side of the building look decent mm -hmm. and some green space between the holding lane for the cars and the sidewalk for Belmont Street. There isn't much room there right now. It, there, there isn't much room and you know this was I'd say one of the later layouts we've done we've done many a layout on this property to ensure that we can one have the queuing capacity to ensure there's no detriment to the public um, and then to make sure this fit within any kind of zoning requirements there is we are increasing as much as we can the landscaping across there um, at least from a density standpoint with the shrubbery um, you know we, we just run into this battle of this concern where you know if we rotate the building because we did look at that the scenario would be that you'd actually have less queuing on, on the site. Yes, so we would. felt that there would be more appropriate to increase the queuing capacity through the site, maximizing the perimeter of the site um, with the layout that was provided. Okay, so you answered my question on that. Now I'll ask you another question. Are you fam familiar with the facility that's located at Westgate Mall? Uh, is that directly north? Yeah, it's at Westgate Mall on the west side of the city. Uh, west side, is that where the... No, I'm not familiar. Okay. I looked at that building and took your plans and lined it up for that building. It, I'm of the opinion that what we see at Westgate Mall is the exact same building that we're going to see up on Belmont Street. So is this like a standard building that they would use? Um, so the actual, like, are we talking the footprint or the, the elevations going vertical? The whole thing. Uh, this is prototypical of what Starbucks has. Um, you know, they know what it's, it takes to be successful as, as part of the, the conversation we talk about service time. There's internal layouts that have to be accounted for to optimize that service time that we'd all, we actually see. Um, so all these layouts as much as possible is creating a franchise. You have to have a standard set. So this is their standard set. There's minor deviations here and there. Every site has a little bit of a, a different component, but generally everything lays out the exact same. The treatments going vertical, um, what we're seeing now, not only is Starbucks having this nationwide, this look, but what we're seeing is a lot of other users uh, in the industry are actually looking very similar to this. There's a slight variations. Um, there are people using some kind of elevation that looks like this in the configuration as well. So what kind of signage can we expect to see on this building? Uh, the signage... The logo? The, what's it, as of right now, it would comply. Starbucks has not yet provided us with a signage package for this property. They have not identified the necessary signage that they the need. The ones I've seen have a logo on the building. There will be a logo. To my understanding, there will be a logo. Do you know if there's a freestanding sign that goes with this? Uh, there is actually an existing uh, pylon sign that serves the entire shopping center. Yes. But I've been informed that Starbucks would be placed on that uh, pylon sign. They would not have a separate pylon sign for themselves. Okay, good. Board members, anything else? Everybody's good? Oh. All right, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? I don't see anybody. I, seeing none, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? <coughs> seeing none, I'll close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected official that wants to be heard on this issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. That concludes the public portion of the hearing. Now we will deliberate as a board. Mr. Chairman, I think, you know, I look out at that property every day, and um, since the rare property closed, it's become a blight on that entire area. 
anything they're going to do there, especially when he speaks of the greenery and the fences, is going to be 10 times what it is now. Um, not to mention, it'll be a lot easier for me to get a coffee across the street than having to get my car and drive away. But um, I guess my, my point being is, I think, you know, I think when you look all over the place and you see Starbucks buildings, they're, they're well maintained, they have good lighting. Mr. Sweeney, I know, is going to be happy about. Um, and um, I think, you know, they, they always have good, good, good vegetation. They, they, they maintain their buildings. Things are clean. I think, especially right in that front where it's become, uh, there's, been a, there's been an issue between the two landlords of the Shaw's building and with the Stop and Shop building and the stuff that's gone on in that parking lot. I think this will add great perspective and uh, will make, will really spruce up that area. That, that's my point. I think you enhance what I, I think by putting a Starbucks in there, you not only enhance the, the, the current surrounding businesses that are there, but you're attracting other businesses uh, of similar or greater caliber uh, to develop in that area. So, so the chair would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motions are made and second to approve. Will your clerk please call the roll? Mr. Lanis? Yes. Ms. Greenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Chief Nadelli? Yes. Chair Gallagher? Yes. So, Chair, that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. Good luck. Okay, the next petition, 2252 for 238 Warren Avenue, has okay, been withdrawn. Like right? The next petition is 2253, the petition of 46 Montello Street, LLC, care of 1325 Belmont Street, Brockton, Mass., for a special permit and variance for the construction of a 54 apartment building in a C2 zone located at 46 Montello Street. Good evening, members of the board, Mr. Chairman, members, Mr. Clerk, Madam Clerk. Um, my name is Attorney John McCluskey, and uh, thank you for having this hearing so late at night. Um, Not by choice. I know the board doesn't like to go that late. Neither do I. I was ready for a nap, I think. But um, I'm, I'm here representing uh, Joffrey Anatole, who's been before you uh, about a year ago on this very same uh, property in a similar project, <clears throat> which the board approved. A year ago, we came before you seeking uh, approval of a 64 unit, one and two bedroom apartment building. Uh, Joffrey's got some experience downtown Brockton now. He's done two other projects, uh, 47 West Elm and, and 47 uh, Pleasant Street both of which uh, have, have been very successful. Uh, the Pleasant Street property was probably one of the first that, that came before the board. Um, there were some misgivings in the beginning, but I think he, he went over the board and, and the city on, on the type of work that he does. The reason why we're back here is that the board uh, approved a 64-unit apartment building, which included this strip along the southerly side of the property. The next door neighbor landlord to the Dunkin' Donuts, and not the Dunkin' Donuts itself, but the landlord, appealed that case to the Superior Court, claiming uh, some ownership rights and adverse possession rights in this strip of land. And Joffrey, rather than waiting, and he's been dealing with them for on and on and on for the whole year, rather than waiting for the court system, which quite frankly, through COVID is, is, uh, is quite delayed these days. It's, it's very difficult to get a case through court. 
decided to shrink the project to 54 units. Uh, my memory serves me, I think it's uh, 30 or 32 single uh, uh, apartments and 22 uh, two bedroom apartments. Um, we're seeking uh, a relief from parking uh, because we're in the downtown area. And as before, uh, we're right next to the MBTA, we're by, by Bat bus station and uh, public transportation. And what Joffrey has found in his apartment buildings is all, although there is considerable use of his, his parking facilities, he doesn't maximize the complete use of the parking. So we're at a little bit below one space per unit. These are the types of units that you don't anticipate families coming into, usually it's one or two people. Many people would you be using the T. Um, on the second floor above the parking, and there's this ground level parking here, inside and outside of the building, uh, ample room for emergency vehicles coming and going, um, ample access uh, to, the, to the, all of the property. Um, one thing that should be noted, and we discussed it before, and I think the MBTA actually was at the last meeting, uh, there's a, as you know, there's the right of way uh, for the, the train station and the tracks above the property. I incidentally, the, um, the living units will all be above the, the uh, train tracks and have every, every unit will have a, a view of something, whether it be the tracks or above. It, it, you know, you'd be able to see probably a pretty good vista of the city or downtown or something. Uh, nothing will be won't, will be blocked. But uh, the T has uh, in the in the deed restrictions or in the in the deed, there's a uh, an area back here which allows the T 27 to 30 feet uh, to access their wall to con to make repairs to do whatever they need to do uh, to access that. Joffrey has designed, and he's been dealing with the T for well over a year. I, I accidentally uh, printed a, an email that <clears throat> came from the T the other day. It was 30 pages long uh, from all of the emails that Joffrey's gone back and forth. And he's had meetings with the uh, MBTA regarding their access. Ross Messina, by the way, is here tonight to discuss if there's any questions on whether or not there'd be access to the property. I just wanted to say, it's 27 for Covenant. We're not required to give them access. It's not a right of way. It's not, it's, it's not a right of way, and I didn't say a right of way. It, they, they have the... They don't have access. We're going out of a way to provide them. They have the right to, to uh, work on their, uh, on their uh, retaining wall, and in general terms, without getting into the specifics of the technicalities of rights of way versus uh, other aspects. There's the right, we're, we're far enough away, we're over 30 feet away from the uh, wall uh, to allow any work to be done. Joffrey, in addition, has uh, given them, of course, this area will be open because there's no, no uh, uh, ability to, uh, presently, to, to use this. And, of course, once he builds the building, that will always be open. Um, they'll have the, uh, the right to... Uh, maintain their their building he's uh, allowed them to come would allow them to come through the building with machinery equipment in order to take care of whatever they need to take care of so that really is off the table as far as uh, any concerns and i don't think the mbt is here tonight but they were the last time and incidentally <clears throat> they did not appeal the, the the last case so i think they're satisfied with with what's going on and how he would has properly addressed that um so we have uh, 54 units, one and two bedrooms. This board uh, approved last year uh, a variance and, and various uh, uh, approvals to construct that building. Now we're shrinking it. The, uh, the apartments themselves, I think, are actually a little larger. Uh, most, if not all of them, have walk-in closets. Beautiful, you know, they're, they're truly luxury apartments. And, there's a, a nice gym on the second floor. There's a workspace area to, to use to a lot of people working from home these days. So they'd be able to have internet access. <clears throat> if you went to any one of his buildings uh, downtown, you'd see the amenities are really <clears throat> quite incredible as far as having uh, 
a nice way to live on the on the um, West Elm property. You can come and, and maybe you can you no, know, you can come along the uh, in your car and hit the button and the gate opens and then it closes. So there's good security, um, uh, ability for UPS and and uh, the post office to to deliver their um, their deliveries. Um, so this is in a C2 zone. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's zoned for commercial use. This has been the site of the uh, uh, D'Angelo's for many, many years, probably 20 or 30, if not more years. They pretty much closed down. The place has been vacant for many years. And downtown is, is changed. You know, uh, I remember as a kid going down on my bicycle and going to the movies, and that all changed when the mall came in. And, and, and downtown has, has changed in such a way that we really need to be, have it revitalized. And Joffrey is, is doing a good job uh, single-handedly uh, taking care of that, that need for downtown Brockton. So the hardship here, because it's zone C2 and the zoning hasn't changed, the hardship really is the zone itself. Because what are you going to come down here? And what types of businesses are you going to come down and bring into downtown Brockton? It takes a half an hour for me to leave my office on Belmont Street to get over to the, to the east side of Brockton. There's probably 25 lights. Um, the first building that he, he uh, revitalized in downtown Brockton was the old standard modern building on, um, on Pleasant Street. They couldn't do business in downtown Brockton with all their stores, uh, with all their uh, trucking and what have you. They just couldn't get across the, the city in a in a, uh, a way that would uh, be able to have them function uh, in a right way. So, with with the advent of um, the Trinity uh, Financial Project, Joffrey's two other projects next door, and the uh, the uh, furniture building, people are now starting to come down down downtown. So things are changing. So the the zone itself, the C2 zone, I think is the hardship. And, and you're not going to have a, nobody's going to come downtown and build an office building, um, bring in a business that's, that's going to need trucks coming and going. Uh, I'm quite surprised that, that Masons is, is hanging in there like they are because they've, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. So um, I think that's the hardship. It's an unusual size, shape, topography because you're, backing up against the T. He's got to design it in a way that, <clears throat> that makes it work so that people can all have nice apartment buildings, apartment uh, places, uh, apartments to live in, something to look at. It's easily accessed to the T and the, and the bat bus uh, transportation. So I think in all, he's, he meets the statutory requirements of uh, 40, Chapter 40A, Section 17, re relative to a variance. So in general, I would say that, especially because the board has approved this once before, and now it's smaller, that this is a, a, a good use of the property. He's effectively handled the controversy next door. That'll get resolved at some point. And um, I think it works, and I, and I would request that the board approve this project. Board members. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, is uh, with the adverse possession piece there uh, still trying this yellow to, strip? Yeah, still trying to reclaim that and add that in a in a, in a dispute, yeah. So so they filed an appeal of the of the zoning decision claiming an interest in this property. They filed an adverse possession claim, and that's pending. Joffrey's been negotiating with them, uh, and. As I say, who knows where that's going? It may be a part of it. It might not. It's in the well, it'll, it's, it, not. it's it's not designed right now to be part of it. There's okay. nothing. Gotcha. There's nothing designed to be part of the project. Okay. Yeah, we we really needed to stay away from that one because we don't want them filing another appeal, uh, and and so we just really didn't want to use that at all. What is the special permit that you're asking for? Uh, the special permit. I apologize. Uh, the height. 
restrictions relative to uh, the, uh, this is a 60 foot high building. And I, as I recall, the ordinance requires, is it? The ordinance is 60, I think you're over that. Why do you have, why do you have to go over 60 feet? What is the height? Speaking of the mic. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. One of the revisions we made to try to appease the MBTA, um, which will never be possible to do completely and fully, um, is we increased the height of the floor deck from eight feet on the original design to 12 feet so that, you know, if construction vehicles or, you know, emergency vehicles or anything has to get under there, 12 feet is a very large space. Um, that's clear. So that means the actual deck will probably be 15 feet with steel and whatnot. But right there is five or six additional feet from, you know, it's almost half a story. So that's one of the reasons for the increased, um, in the, for the increased height is essentially for vehicles to be able to, you know, adequately get to the rear should it be necessary. So that would be the garage height. Correct. 12 feet clear is what we're looking for, but 12 feet clear is not the total height. You know what I mean? I don't know exactly what the steel will be, but Dave could probably, what do you think total, Dave? 16 feet, so right there, just on the first floor deck, which is, right, outrageously high, but we're trying to accommodate hey. for everybody, <laughs> even for us, you know? So if I, not to interrupt the chairman, but so this was my big question. So if I, I go in the front of that garage with a piece of fire apparatus, I can go right out the back. So 12 feet clear, um, depending on what truck you bring in. Um, yeah. I'm good wherever we are. With, with as, as, long, as long as you're not exceeding a height of 12 feet, yeah, you'll be able to pull in and actually go under. But I, I guess my, my question is, I'm good with the 12 feet. 12 oh, okay. feet is great. My, my, my bigger question is, is it, do I have a straight shot? Uh, no. So the garage, this garage door on the right, um, we, this is a manual door, and we put this here in case of emergency, in case success, access is needed. It can be opened up. But that's a manual door. This door is 18 feet wide. And um, again, we realize that this turning radius could be difficult. So this is just a manual door where you could have a straight shot in case of emergency. You can go to the back. It, yeah, we could put a, um, what's the, uh, Jesus, what's the, what are those boxes knox called? Box. We could put a Knox box here for you guys, you know, just like in the front where, you yeah. know, if you need the key, yeah. you can open that's it. That's a conversation for later, Dave. Okay. You know that it's 12 feet. Is right. And, and that's, yeah. and that's yeah. strictly so that you have the straight shot. Right. Great. A lot of the issues that we talked about last time, I don't think uh, we need to get into because we've been all through them. However, I did look at the document that came from the T and their response letter. I just want to mention that this is the, the meat of the subject that I picked out of that. The construction permit cannot be issued without prior approval from the MBTA before the city of Brockton may issue a construction permit. So whatever con whatever problem, just give that to the clerk and the clerk will take care of it. I actually have it, but thank you. Oh, okay. right. So to, just to alleviate a lot of concern on the part of the board, the fact that we are granting or may grant a variance and special relief for this, there's still other things that are gonna come into play here with the concern of the MBTA. And the second thing was a consent form from the Mass Department of Transportation before a building permit can be issued by the city of Brockton. So those are issues I think that the petitioner is gonna to have to deal with with the MBTA. Uh, I don't think that's anything that we really need to get into, but just be aware that what he's talking about tonight with the accessibility to the rear of the building, uh, those are th things that are gonna be done to placate the T on their ability to get at their tracks and that wall behind your building. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I'll be very short and quick on this. I, the summary on the one and a half pages clearly explains what our legal requirements are, what our legal obligations are. We've vetted this extensively. We're outside of the um, area of influence, meaning we do not require a separate license from the MBTA. This is an indisputable fact. It's a code requirement that'll go to the building department, but we are not building within the area of influence and therefore we do not require a permit. In regards to the second part of the MBTA letter where they request a special permit for land, uh, land that's purchased that was previously owned by the railroad that had um, either a right of way or an easement, um, 
that is not applicable to us because we did not purchase a piece of land that had a former right of way or easement that has on any deed or any plot plan going back to 1900. It does not exist. The application itself specifically asks to cite a specific you know, easement or right of way. We cannot do it because it does not exist. Uh, I'm actually shocked that the MBTA wrote that letter because they don't know how to interpret their own rules and regulations. I'll leave it at that, but um, we're very much on top of it and I will deal with that. Okay, I just wanted to... The simple answer is we're gonna work with the MBTA. You're gonna have to work with them, yeah. So the T, uh, in, on, on the T's, uh, their impression is they still have to have ability to get at that and it sounds like that is gonna be taken care of. Uh, Correct. I, I guess I would have uh, one last question. Assuming you get approval working with the MBTA, I, I, do you have an expected groundbreaking time or? So we are gonna to have to address this issue, you know, after tonight with the MBTA. But again, I wanna be clear that as of right now, our legal obligations to the MBTA have been met. We don't have to do anything we're even doing. We have a 27 foot covenant in place, okay? Um, that's not a right of way, that's not an easement. We have no further obligation to them. I've been backwards over the last year trying to accommodate them. They've been non-responsive. They fail to give direct answers. Uh, no, there's no accountability, no organization. And I say this in the most respectful way possible. Our legal obligations to them are met. There's nothing really more we can do. Now, if there's some, uh, requirement that we legally have to comply with, we'll do it. But, you know, we asked Ross Messina to come here who has 40 plus years in, um, you know, excavation and site preparation to further describe kind of the changes we've made to the site for access. We're talking about access to a 12 foot retaining wall. Our height deck is 12 feet. There's a separate access door, not to mention, we now have a whole strip of land on the right side, the disputed land, which again, um, we're not using this development, but it's still there. It means it can't be built on. You can drive right up there. What, what we've done is above and beyond anything that could be required. We had a meeting with the MBTA nine months ago, and in the meeting, um, Dave from BKA was there. You know, one of the people uh, working there said if they were gonna do work, they'd do it overhead from the other side. Someone else said we've worked with much less and much worse. I mean, and then the higher ups told, kind of told them to shush. I mean. I've done everything I can to work with them. We will make sure we comply with the law to get building permits, but what you see is, it was, I don't wanna lie to you guys, it's gonna be the end result of what we're gonna provide because we are not required to do anything more and we can't do anything more than we've already done. Uh, that's probably a, too long of an answer. All right. I don't think it's the position of the board to get involved with the legal that you're talking about, but I, I know the last time you were before us, we did have a representative here from the T who had concerns and I just wanted to re reiterate to the board that the T apparently still wants to have some concern about what goes on. And I think what Jeffrey just explained is that there is communication between him. There's been a, the that's the 30 page email or the, the, the multiple, multiple emails back and forth. I and read he, the whole and thing. he's had meetings with them. It, it's, it's really, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's not something that is the board's issue, it's the T's. And, and he's working with them. Yeah, that's what he does. Any he works other, works with whoever ha ha he has to. Everybody's good? All right, I'm gonna close that. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in favor? Not yet. Oh yeah, you can speak in favor. You're not a counselor anymore. <laughs> I come as a new product, different product than what I want once, once before. But in any case, um, counselor. Now it's former. <laughs> But any any case, um, I did want to come this evening to um, to cheer on again uh, Geoffrey with um, going to work and working hard on this particular project. And um, you know, he and I have been, become very good friends uh, as a, as he has with a lot of the other councils over the last several years. Um, and we take that back to when he started um, his first project on uh, right on Pleasant Street when he took the um, printing shop there and, and made that into what it is today. That everybody seems to. Um, I've been living there for quite some time and, and, and thank God it's still um, uh, going in the thrust that, that he started. The next place was when he took down um, you know, on 47 uh, West Down Street. We finally got rid of a, a burned building that sat there for nine and a half years until somebody like Geoffrey came around and, and wanted to do something and, and that was done and started under the uh, Carpenter administration. Um, and uh, I have to say the late Bill Carpenter was there and we dug the when we dug the hole, but but unfortunately Bill wasn't with us when uh, to see the completion, I, I'm sure he'd be proud. And I know he'll be proud to see 
just what's going to be done here at the same same type type of um, setting as what he showed you here, and, and that's going to be over on Montello Street. And um, I do agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I don't I don't think it's a place that you want to get into in regards to the um, into what the T is doing, and, and, and I think I think that's the wisest uh, thing to do, um, and appreciate that as well. So I, I just want to I just want to speak um, again, just to indicate that. Um, I know that if anything, uh, and I, I know that I, I spend enough time with, with uh, Geoffrey that I can sense in, in my feeling that if there are other pieces of property in the city, like these several pieces of property that he's been able to develop, he's going to continue to do that because he loves the city of Brockton. He owns other properties about, um, he takes care of all his properties, but um, he spends a lot, a lot of time, and um, I, I think what's going to be built on Montello Street is going to be a great a great plus again uh, uh, for the city. So I just wanted to uh, say uh, uh, I cheer that on, and um, hopefully I'll be back to uh, cheer him on again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in favor? Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Ted Carmen. I'm the uh, president of Concord Square Planning and Development. We are the developers of 93 Center Street, the old furniture building, and 28 Petronelli Way, the old Goody Petronelli gym building, both of which are under construction, uh, both of which we expect to be finished in uh, December or January. Uh, I'm here to speak strongly in favor of this. We feel that this building that Joffrey is proposing is consistent with the overall plan for downtown. It's very important to our investors, our, our lenders, we raised millions of dollars for these two projects. It's very important to them that the overall plan in Brockton move forward as set forth. Uh, in fact, our investors and bankers are very, very impressed with Brockton's plans and with the consistent uh, uh, support of major projects in the downtown. And of course, it goes without saying that uh, Joffrey set the standard for building market rate housing in Brockton with his two projects already. We feel that the market for this kind of housing is almost unlimited because of the train and because of the 35 minutes to downtown Boston, where there's an enormous shortage of housing uh, that this will help support. So our feeling, we strongly recommend approval of, of John Joffrey's petition. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wants to speak in favor? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Is there any elected or appointed official that wants to be heard on the issue? Good evening, board, Mr. Chairman. I'm Shirley Azak, Ward 7 City Councilor. This is not in Ward 7. I wish it was. Um, because Joffrey, I, even though I don't usually get myself involved in other wards, but I have known uh, Mr. Anatole for the past eight years since I became a City Councilor, and I have followed his projects. And as you all know, we may be ward councilors, but when we're voting here, we vote to improve the, the whole the city as a whole the city of Brockton and this is um, this project is really important to our downtown um, I think it's long overdue um, I ask that you vote in favor of this and let mr. Anatole deal with whatever he needs to do with um, you know with what's happening with the MBTA as far as the city of Brockton we're in need of this we, we need market rate housing this is really revamping our downtown. And I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but a few, about a month ago, the Chamber of Commerce had a, an event with the South Coastal Railroad coming back with Fall River and um, New Bedford, cutting back through to Boston. That's going to be crucial for us. Nobody was excited, I think, as much as I was, because I'm thinking we, um, housing next to our um, railroad near our uh, stations is going to be really crucial in you know, and it's taken way too long. I've been on the council for nine years and we've been talking about this for nine years for these projects. So I want to see these move forward and we rely on your expertise. And, um, but I ask that, I mean, I'm not going to repeat what my uh, fellow um, uh, dean of the council just mentioned, but his projects speak for themselves. I mean, nobody believed in the project up next to Perkins Park, but 
there's no vacancies and it's absolutely beautiful. And I don't think anybody else would have invested in a building next to Perkins Park, but um, he did and he did on 47 West Elm Street in a building that's what was burnt down and all we got were complaints about it. So I have faith in that he'll do what's best uh, for the city of Brockton. So I hope you approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Thompson, you're up back there. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <clears throat> so I'm, uh, I'm before you today to speak in favor of this project. Uh, I, I wrote a letter of support. I don't know if that made your packages, um, but I hope you had an opportunity to read that. Um, even though I submitted a letter, I thought it was important to come before the board and speak uh, um, openly about my support for this project. Uh, what we have is a uh, 54 units of market rate housing that's going to be high-end luxury apartment living in uh, the center of downtown. As previously stated, that is uh, exactly what we're trying to accomplish in our downtown. It fits uh, in perfectly with our urban renewal plan, and, um, and, and this is going to be a fantastic uh, uh, facility. Uh, Joffrey has a, uh, a proven track record. Uh, we all know uh, what he accomplished over at uh, 47 Pleasant Street and what he accomplished at 47 West Elm, and we're expecting the same high-end, high-amenity um, luxury apartment building, uh, this one right next to our uh, train track in downtown Brockton. Uh, it will also um, uh, remove that blighted area, that, that blight of um, in an abandoned building, and uh, it, it's going to, as I said, I mean, looking at the plans, uh, and, and they really didn't get into them, but uh, on that uh, first floor, uh, it, there's going to be um, uh, high-end amenities, uh, uh, a gym, um, a work, uh, a workspace uh, for people who live in this apartment. Um, it's going to have uh, uh, ac easy access. And, um, you know, this is just a, a type of development that Brockton needs. And uh, I hope you um, vote in favor of this project. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other elected official wants to be heard on the issue? Seeing none, I'm going to close that portion of the hearing that completes the public hearing. I'm now going to open it up for discussion among board members. Mr. Chairman, I think, um, in my opinion, and just seeing Mr. Anatoly's work around the city um, from a public safety perspective and how he works with the city and what they do to try to make everyone in the, in, in, in the city safe, He's more than willing to help in any way he can. And what he's doing downtown right now with this building will, will really top a lot of that off. Um, I think um, we've had some real good progress in that area. And, and I know when it comes to certain things, just like tonight, the, you know, the 12 foot, 16 foot, but 12 foot to get a fire truck through is, is huge. And, and just th those are the types of things that he's forecasting in the future that I think work real well. His buildings come out nice. They're, they're pleasurable to look at um, when you go by them. And this, again, you know, as a long, lifelong city resident, I think this is what the downtown area needs. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, the councilor mentioned it, uh, but the South Coast Rail, when that comes in, we're going to see a lot more uh, opportunity to get to the job place um, and eventually, you know, Brockton becoming more of a job place. So uh, developments like this are, in my opinion, exactly what we need. I want to also mention that today I received a letter of support for the downtown urban redevelopment from uh, Councilor uh, William Farwell. He endorses and supports the petition uh, and encourages us to grant the relief. So in your book, there's a whole slew of letters of support. And I just wanted to mention that was an extra letter that came in today. Uh, the other thing that is interesting about this location is when you follow what the uh, the state political environment is encouraging for development of this type of housing in relation to uh, train stations and I think we'll probably find that there's some legislation where it, it actually makes a circumference of so many feet within uh, a train station that they're encouraging communities to create this type of housing. Transit oriented, transit -oriented housing, I think is the, what they call the thing. So uh, this is encouraged not only with letters that have come in from us or to us from local uh, supporters, but also it appears as though on the state level 
uh, they are encouraging cities to actually look at their zoning rules and regulations to allow this to happen. So even though this, what they're asking for here tonight is a use variance, and the, the actual zone doesn't change as far as zoning, but the use is what we're looking to grant here. I think it follows right along in suit with what the political environment, uh, not only in our local community, but on the state level is encouraging boards to do. And they're encouraging cities and towns to amend their zoning so that probably someday they won't even have to come to us. Uh, they'll just go get a building permit. So it sounds like this falls right into what the uh, feeling is across the border other than just Brockton. Motion to grant. Second. <clears throat> Motion has been made and seconded to grant. We had no stipulations with this thing, did we? We had nothing. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Lanis? Yes. Ms. Screenberry? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Chief Nadelli? Uh, yes. Chair Galligan? Yes. Mr. Chair, that's five in the affirmative, zero in the negative. Vote is five in the affirmative, none in the negative. The petition is granted. So before we adjourn for tonight, I want to give you the board a heads up that probably in the August meeting, we're going to have to take a vote on who you want to elect as your chairman of the board. That time has come again. Huh? A whole year's gone by. So, it'll come in August. It felt like yesterday. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. We are adjourned. <laughs>